surgery almost 100 speakers from across the globe the WWCRS 2021 is the first of its kind 16 sessions in this two-day extravaganza. The entire ophthalmic community bringing together the best of the best to keep you up to date with ideas from all around the world. Organizers Sergio Canabrava, Brazil and Ashvin Agarwal, India WWCRS 2021 Global Names Directly to Your Home starts now. Here you are again, the day two of this big event. Today is the big day. Today you have Film Festival and Virtual Live Surgery. Ashley, what do you want to, to say for everybody, my friend? Thank you, everybody. Thank you, Sergio. Thank you, speakers. Thank you, sponsors and audience. Without you, there is no program. So thank you so much for coming back. Uh, I want to give you uh, at the onset, Sergio spoke about it. But I'm going to tell you a little bit more. We have the Film Festival Award Show today. All 90 films have been loaded on World WCRS website. We also have the virtual life surgery event. Don't miss that. There's just a couple of instructions which I want to give everybody because if they were not here on the first day of the event, that was May 29th, I want to tell you that there is a chat window on the right corner of your screen use that to put in your questions during the session it is a very fast-paced event and the second your poll questions the moderators will be putting them up 
right in that same chat window so don't miss the opportunity of clicking in if you're watching this on youtube please come to the world wcrs website because that's where you will be able to use the chat window for poll questions and asking your questions so let's move with the program because i know you guys are eager and ready to go Dipinder Daliwa, USA, and Parag Majmudar, USA. We welcome the panelist, Rajesh Sinha, India. And featuring the speakers, Sam Garg, USA. Francis Price Jr., USA. Gregory Maloney, Australia. And Susan Jacob, India. Organizers. Sergio Canabrava, Brazil. And Ashvin Agarwal, India. Well, thank you, uh, everybody, for being here, especially my moderators and my faculty here. Uh, I'm not going to take any more time of this event. I'm going to dive right in and hand over to my moderators who have done an exceptional job of getting such fabulous speakers and panelists on board. Thank you so much, Deep, and thank you so much, Parag. Uh, off to you guys. I'm out. You're on mute. Thank you so much, Ashvin. And, you know, you and Sergio are really rising stars in ophthalmology. You guys have arranged such a phenomenal world event and we are just honored to be a part of it. So um, Parag, do you, would you like to say a few words before we no, get started? I mean, yeah, thank you all. Uh, um, the, the organizers, moderators, speakers, panelists, audience, <clears throat> the, the amount of work that goes into this is just astronomical and, and thanks to everyone behind the scenes. So take it away, DP. Thank you so much. So we're going to jump right in. This is going to be one of the best sessions of the meeting because we have the best speakers in the world right here for you today. So we're going to start with Sam Garg, who is a, an associate professor in University of California, Irvine. And he's gonna be speaking on the safety basket suture for complex descent. Take it away, Sam. Just before that, we have a small poll question that oh. Prague has set up. Let's uh, get that question out there to the audience. Prague, all yours. Yes, let me uh, pull up the info here. So we'd like to uh, have everyone chime in um, on the chat. The poll question is, which surgical technique for the treatment of Fuchs dystrophy do you feel most comfortable performing at this time? And you have four choices, it's DSEC, DMEC, DSO, decimate stripping only, or PDEC. So please uh, take a few minutes and, and enter your answers, and we'll discuss this later on during the, during the question and answer session. And then we'll start with uh, Sam Gard's presentation now. All right, I'm having a, a few technical difficulties sharing my screen here, as, as one would expect right on the first morning. So let me do this real quick here, I apologize. Uh, so I'll, I'll talk a, a little bit about my um, procedure here as we, uh, rats, I have to quit and reopen. Can we move to the next speaker? My apologies, and then I'll be right back on. Absolutely, this is the fun of Zoom. Thank you audience for being so patient with us. Um, <clears throat> you know, technology is amazing until it doesn't work. So we, we know how to do this. We are going to move right on to Greg Maloney's talk. And Greg actually is coming to us from Vancouver, Canada. He uh, 
shifted continents uh, and is now a uh, professor at the University of British Columbia. So Greg is gonna, really Greg has been a pioneer in, in DSO and I have read his publications and his use of Repossible uh, with decimate stripping only has really revolutionized this procedure. So I'm so excited to hear about stripping in 2021 an update on DSO and also known as DWEC. Greg, let's see if you can take it away. <laughs> I'll see if I can take it away. Thanks, okay. Pete. I'll see how I go. Okay, let's try this. How's that? That's perfect. Okay, okay. wonderful. We see your screen. Thank you very much. Well, thanks again to the organizers for the invitation to talk today. I always enjoy talking on this topic um, and deep for your kind words as well. Uh, disclosures, I'm a consultant to Kowai Industries manufacturer of uh, Repazidol, and I always acknowledge uh, Sydney University and Sydney Eye Hospital Foundation who fund my research in Australia on this work. Um, we've given, well, I've given quite a few talks on this um, topic, and, and in the early days, there were more questions than answers, really. How do we know who is the correct patient to receive a, a DSO? Uh, do they all need a rokinase inhibitor? Does that drug even work? Is it essential? Um, what's the right way to perform the surgery? Um, how are the patients healing? Are, are we seeing corneal clearance after a DSO due to mitosis or is it migration or is it a combination of both those things? And really, is this a short-term party trick that we can all pull off or does it really have a place in the longer term as an in the algorithm of treatment for fixed dystrophy? I'd say most of those questions today we have answers to. <clears throat> this was our publication, one of the publications that Deep referred to, which was published around a year ago. And this was our, uh, our, our in-depth analysis of 23 patients receiving DSO with repazidol as a supplement. Um, and what we now know and, and feel confident in is that if you choose this surgery for a patient with Fuchs dystrophy, this is not for PBK, if they have an adequate peripheral cell reservoir, um, preferably measurable, but not always the case, um, if you're doing this mainly for a Fuchs profile with central guti, uh, you do the surgery correctly and you supplement with topical rokinase inhibitor, you can really tell your patients they have a great chance of success. It should be in order of 95%. Uh, with regards to ROC inhibitor, how do we know that a drug is doing anything in a patient? First, we have to have a uh, measurable or observable tissue effect once we administer the drug and then ideally see a, a withdrawal of that tissue effect once the drug has ceased. That's exactly what we saw in our study uh, last year. In around nine out of 23 cases, we found the surprising uh, clinical observation that edema actually came back once the patient's uh, ROC inhibitor was stopped um, upon achieving corneal clearance in nine out of 23 cases. In some of those patients, when we restarted the repositor, the, the edema went away again. So in my mind, that really settled the debate about the utility of rokinase inhibitor. That was physical evidence uh, that convinced me that this is a, an important drug that we all need in our profession. <clears throat> we now know that the uh, surgical technique of a DSO does matter. We're creating an optical zone in the cornea, which we do with other types of corneal surgery. And when you do that, it needs to be centered in the cornea. Uh, if you're combining it with a FACO, the central thinning will create a small hyperopic shift that has to be accounted for. Uh, you need to keep the size of this surgery to around a four to five millimeter diameter at the maximum. Uh, appealing, and the most critical I feel of all, is that appealing technique with respect of the stroma needs to be uh, observed. Otherwise, there is trauma to the stroma that initiates an abnormal healing response, which we term focal non-clearance. This is the most common mistake uh, early surgeons will make in, in this operation. There seems to be with stromal trauma an ab abnormal or different healing response that's initiated that will take years, months to years to uh, settle down and results in a focal posterior nodule that limits the patient's vision and time to healing. <coughs> Our initial patient, the very first patient I ever did is now at her seventh year, is maintaining a clear cornea, maintaining a good cell count uh, and remains happy with the outcome of the surgery. Early in our uh, learning curve of this operation, we did offer this to a more broader range of fixed dystrophy. And in one patient here with limbus to limbus goody, we tried this. Uh, she was 43 years old, was trying to avoid a transplant. But unfortunately, what we learned was, you know, that, that as a solution for widespread goody wasn't a good uh, surgical option. And there was failure of that operation at year three. That, this is that patient's, these are still photos from that patient proceeding to a DMEX surgery. What we also know at this point in the game is 
you're not compromising the outcome of a DMEC if a, if a DSO or a DWIC uh, does fail. Uh, the decimator axis is enlarged and a critical point is to clear the central visual axis of any cellular debris or any sort of decimal scarring uh, as we see in the top right panel. And this is that patient at week one after a DMEC. So with three years of a, a, a DWEC followed by a DMEC, you really cannot tell this DMEC from any other DMEC that you might do in, in your clinical practice. And finally, you know, does this have a spot in the algorithm for Fuchs dystrophy? This is the patient who, one of the patients who most convinced me. She had a DSEC for Fuchs dystrophy 10 or more years ago in her fellow eye elsewhere, which then failed. And she had a second DSEC uh, by a training surgeon, which failed again at two years and came to me for DSEC number three in the fellow eye and was at this point traumatized from transplants. In her other eye, she had central guttata and edema, um, and we offered her a DSO with rapazidol, and here she is at four, four weeks post-surgery with an uncorrected vision of 6.9, and asked me, why didn't I just do this in my fellow eye? And I said, look, we just didn't know back then. So there is a great option. DSO represents a great option for the right patient in Fuchs dystrophy. It's a, a, a part of my clinical algorithm now for this treatment. And finally, just to sign off, this is a, an etching done by a patient of mine showing her central guttata or goody pre-DSO and post-DSO. She felt it was worthy of an artwork. That was great. Thank you so much, Greg. Uh, what a wonderful talk. I have so many questions, but I'm going to hold them till the end for our panel discussion. And I would encourage the audience to also ask questions. So. Thank you for that. What a way to start the session. And now we're going to go back to California. And I think Sam is teed up to teach us about his safety basket suture for complex DSEC. Yes, thank, thank you. Sorry about that. Thank you to the uh, organizers for including me. Uh, my name is Sam Garg. I'm at uh, the Gavin Herbert Eye Institute at the University of California, Irvine. And I'll be talking about a basket safety suture for complex DSEC cases. Here are my financial disclosures. Um, so we published in, in Cornea in 2016, a technique paper for a basket uh, safety suture for difficult um, endothelial keratoplasty patients. As many people have, uh, we've transitioned to using DSEC only for our toughest cases and reserving DMEC for more, more routine cases and we've yet to try DSO. So I'm, I'm really intrigued by the last, uh, by Dr. Maloney's talk. I'm really, really intrigued about that here in California. Uh, but essentially what you're using is a, a non-contact suture underneath the DSEC graft. So it's not appositional to the graft if done correctly. And it's just there in cases where you're unsure if you can maintain an air bubble uh, long enough to maintain graft adherence. So uh, use a, um, we use a CTC6 needle um, on a, a tenoproline and we have it double armed and we'll pass it underneath the, the graft here uh, and then uh, with, the, with the same arm uh, past it, again, it's step three, you'll see uh, about 90 degrees away. And then we'll take the second half and you wanna maintain a, a really sharp needle for this. So then we'll use the second half to then uh, complete the basket suture underneath, uh, underneath the, uh, the DSEC lenticule. And when you're done, you have sort of a, a four or eight point uh, possible fixation of the graft and so the, the benefit is if the graft does detach, it's a very easy way to, um, to rebubble it in the clinic. I know a lot of people have trepidation about that, especially uh, if you're a trainee or not with a lot of experience and having a graft dislocation is, is, is uh, not favorable and it's difficult to explain to the patient. So if this does happen, you're able to place an air bubble right behind the graft right in clinic. And here's a quick video of the, of the procedure. And you can see here, this is a patient with a uh, filtering bleb and I'm taking this needle and passing it all, all the way through. You wanna make sure you, that you don't hit the edge of the graft uh, and you're gonna carefully pass it underneath uh, the, um, the DSEC lenticule, making sure you're staying peripheral um, and then uh, making sure that you, you cover enough of the edge of the graft so that if it does dislocate or want to uh, detach that you have uh, an area where it can contact the periphery of the graft uh, such that it provides this um, support if needed. Now, um, 
you know, one, I think criticism of the technique is that a lot of these people don't need it. Uh, you know, you're not sure. Uh, I'm in a teaching institution uh, and oftentimes uh, it's the fellow seeing the patient in post-op and depending on their comfort level, uh, they may or may not be comfortable um, rebubbling the patient. So this allows me some um, assurances that if the graft uh, were to detach that the patient is uh, able or the, the doctor is able to rebubble the patient, although I will say our fellows are excellent. Here's a, a post-operative image of a graft uh, with the stitches intact. And this is an interesting image showing a OCT showing that the, you know, if done correctly, you can actually maintain a little bit of clearance between the graft and the, and the suture. Uh, we subsequently uh, published a uh, technique, or a, sorry, a, a series of these patients. And in the interest of time, I'll go real quick here. Uh, but we had, um, you know, uh, about almost 70 eyes um, with, with pretty good follow-up. And um, the, here's the reason for placing uh, the, uh, for having a, a DSEC and then uh, reasons for uh, placing the basket suture, you know, mostly because of issues where we were sure, or we weren't sure if we could maintain an adequate air bubble for long enough to maintain that graft. Uh, complications really, you know, we did have a couple that detached that then required uh, rebubbling. Um, you know, we had some long-term graft failure. Uh, we did have a, a case of early graft failure, or a couple of cases of early graft failure, but no, no evidence of infection. Uh, the suture only stays in for as long as is needed. So typically we'll leave it in day one, we'll see the patient back day three or four, and if the graft is attached, the, the suture comes out of the slit lamp. Cell count loss, uh, we found that, you know, certainly a, a limited uh, sample size here, but the, the cell loss was acceptable, especially when compared to some of the surgical trauma in these complex cases that we see in the published literature. Uh, so in conclusion, I feel like it's a, it's a, good, it's a good technique for uh, difficult cases, especially if you're unsure about if keeping the, um, the gas or air in the AC, if the patient has positioning issues, and certainly if there's a, a high likelihood of that air uh, exiting the eye from a glaucoma implant or a fakia. Um, and so, you know, this maybe uh, allows us to do DSEC in cases that were only otherwise uh, full thickness candidates uh, previously. Thank you very much. Thank you, Sam. What a, what a great innovative approach to, to really kind of salvaging these challenging cases and really sticking to endothelial keratoplasty um, even in these very, very difficult, uh, challenging eyes. I love that technique and I, I'm, gonna, I'm going to try it uh, coming up. You know what I also really appreciate is that you have not only just come up with a really innovative technique, but you've studied it. You've looked at the science, you've looked at the data. And so now you're presenting um, really kind of the, the nitty gritty. So thank you so much for that. All right, so speaking of innovators, um, Dr. Susan Jacob is next, and she, I don't think, ever sleeps because every maybe three to six months, she's come up with a brand new procedure or a technique or something just absolutely amazing, thinks out of the box, and is so just a wonderful educator. And I'm so honored to, to call her a dear friend as well. So, Without further ado, let's talk. I'd like to hand it over to uh, Susan Jacob, who's gonna talk about complex cases in PDEC. Thank you. Uh, thanks Deep uh, for that uh, wonderful uh, introduction. And you are such a dear friend as well. Thank you Parag and uh, Dr. Rajesh for uh, being the moderators and uh, for this uh, lovely session, Ashwin and Sergio. Thanks for holding this WWCRS. It's really become a fantastic event and uh, we're really proud of the way you've taken it ahead. Okay, let me just uh, get rid of this and enlarge this. All right, so my talk is on complex cases with uh, uh, PIREC and I thought I would basically show you two videos. Uh, this is a patient who had an iridia and a failed graft as you can see there. So, uh, and, and a vitrectomized eye and an iridia IOL in place. And you can see what I'm doing here is removing the epithelium. Now the complex, uh, the challenges in this case, of course, are the vitrectomized eye, the failed apedic on or an endothelial keratoplasty on a failed graft and uh, uh, basically an, an iridia IUL with gaps over there through which the graft could possibly fall down. The graft, the an iridia IUL is also a bit decentered as you can see. So what I am planning to do here is first center that. So I'm gonna make a Hoffman's pocket over there. 
uh, make a scleral tunnel uh, entry for the uh, graft because I don't want to disturb the graft hose junction of the penetrating keratoplasty. That's this Hoffman tunnel that's being made. And then what I do is basically take two sutures, uh, to a, a double arm suture, basically one uh, arm going below the anaeridia iols uh, haptic. And then as you see, the other arm is going to go above the anaeridia iols haptic. And so that is going to help pull that anaeridia iol into a better centered position. So once that's done, I'm tying down the knot. It's not too centered right now, but what I can do is go and uh, you know slide that IOL into the correct position so that the haptic uh, position is changed. As you see now, you can just sorry, you can just uh, let me go back there. Yeah, you can just kind of adjust that position of the anaridi IOLs with a with a. Uh, uh, any instrument so that now you have a better centered position. So the hap this haptic just slides through that loop into the position you want. Now, here's another thing that's happened and that is that the graft hose junction is actually a little bit weak and it's opening up. So that's uh, another problem. So these are all, of course, uh, make it a very challenging eye to deal with. I've got the air pump going now. And uh, what we are going to do now is uh, basically do an uh, desmetorexis as an air pump tested desmetorexis. And I'll show you the beauty of the period graft is that it's very resilient and that you get not only that you get young cells, but also it makes itself amenable to a lot of procedures that help make period very, very repeatable. You can see I've left a little bit of uh, graft, uh, I'm a little bit of host desmus membrane over there, actually the old graft desmus membrane over there. And I'm going to use that to do a technique that I call as host uh, desmetic scaffolding. That's the period graft. I've injected the graft inside. And now the danger, of course, is that the graph slips through the uh, and a gap in the NIRD IUL. So now what I'm doing is uh, you can see that I've opened up the graft and I've put in the uh, air pump assisted. Uh, I'm using the air pump assisted technique again. So I've got air going through that uh, anterior chamber maintainer. But the beauty is that you saw that unlike a DMEC, I uh, did have an edge fold. I did have a decentered graft. I wasn't spending too much time having a loose graft within the eye. And so I was able to just position it fast, have the air go under the graft. And then uh, the graft, there was no further danger of the graft falling down. I got it into position because of the air pump assisted technique. And then I used the hose decimatic scaffolding to kind of uh, hold the graft in place, make sure that it doesn't detach. And there's another technique that I want to show you here, and that is basically the beauty of uh, being able to pass sutures through the graft. So trans graft sutures, because this is also because the graft hose junction was weak. So I've got trans graft sutures passing, and that's something that you can do with a DZIC, but also with a PDIC and not with a DMEC because the DMEC graft would tear. So that's basically the end of the surgery. And you can see uh, a well-attached graft and a clear cornea. Now, the second... Uh, uh, video I'm going to go through a little faster because of lack of time. Again, a complex case, a large failed therapeutic uh, PK. And you can see that uh, the uh, cornea is really uh, looking very bad. Maybe uh, a case for an optical uh, you know, keratoplasty, but uh, I don't want to do that because uh, the chance of rejection is higher. You can see that I've removed the dismiss membrane, but the view is really, there's nothing that you can see in there. And when you go in with an endoilluminator, shine light with an endoilluminator from outside, you can see these uh, iridal membranes, fibrous membranes, which then I go ahead and dissect with a needle. So basically go between the iris, much like a retina surgeon, dissect that fibrous membrane off the iris and kind of, you know, pull it out. As you can see here, pull that fibrous membrane out and then you can start to see actually the iris that's underneath. Now, when you go back again, you'll see that there's a very small pupil there and you need to kind of, again, go in with a forceps, do lots of uh, intracameral maneuvering, create a pupil there. And uh, then you see a little bit of capsular remnant and I'm going ahead and removing that capsular remnant, uh, putting an iris hook in place so that, uh, you know, I have a better visualization. Go ahead and do a glued intraocular lens. So again, a complex case, it's a vitreptomized eye. It's a, a glued intraocular lens in place. It's a failed penetrating keratoplasty. The iris is not great either. A lot of iris membranes. So obviously there's going to be a lot of bleeding as well. Uh, again, removing all those capsular remnants, putting in the glued intraocular lens and Again, uh, doing a little bit of uh, pupil reconstruction using the single pass fourth row technique. So you can see the glue dial is already put in place. I'm sorry, I think I, I had set a timer for myself and I am out of time, but I will just run through this, get the uh, Peter graft in place and again, uh, float it up. And again, you see that I'm not too particular about how much the Peter graft is uh, actually, uh, you know, uh, whether it's fully uh, unfolded or not, I'm, I am perfectly fine with accepting peripheral edge folds and a slightly decent graft because I can use the air pump assisted PDEC to pull it in place. And that's the first day post-op. This was just before the second lockdown in India. And uh, I don't have a recent picture because when the patient came the second time, we didn't have the clinical photography unit set up there, but uh, the patient still continues to remain clear. The first day itself is very clear as you can see. And basically that's, that's the end of my presentation. Thank you. Okay, all I can say is, wow. 
<laughs> I don't think I would have been able to tackle that eye, Susan. Uh, yeah, you handled that masterfully. And um, that was that was really amazing surgery. So, uh, you know, your patients are, are so lucky to, to have you. All right, so to wrap up our uh, speakers, um, we have Frank Price. And Frank Price is, is well known to everybody. He has really also been an incredible innovator. And I have to say, he is uh, my DSEC teacher. So back in 2005, when I wanted to learn DSEC, I visited uh, Frank Price. And, uh, and he taught me how to do the, the procedure, you know, my first foray into endothelial keratoplasty. So it's been a wonderful ride. And I, and I have to thank you, Frank, for your wonderful teaching and innovation. And, and again, in innovation, uh, Frank is going to share with us how intraoperative OCT has changed endothelial keratoplasty. So Thanks, Frank. Steve. It's a pleasure to be here with you guys today. Can you hear me all right and see my screen? Yes, indeed, we can, Frank. Thank Perfect. you. Perfect. Uh, financial conflict is I'm a consultant for Hog Stride. I'm going to be talking about their intraoperative OCT. And, you know, looking at the poll numbers, everybody finds DMEC a little bit difficult, or a lot of people do. And this is a, a technique that can help you out. And I think it's really something for the future, uh, just like OCT in the office. OCT in the operating room can help us see things better. And it gives us real-time imaging of the cornea, anterior chamber, and posterior chamber. And what's important, I think, is to have a good injected image into the oculars so you don't have to look away. And we use that to orient our DMEC graphs, uh, to look if there's a space with DSEC, and it's a real game changer for DAUC. Now, what's the current state of the art? And this is a iPhone photo through an ocular uh, of one of our microscopes, and it shows the injection image that we get that's overlaid onto what you see normally through the oculars. The purple line is where the OCT uh, cut is being made, and down below is the image. You can see the cornea, the iris, and you can see the 43-year-old donor that it's curled correctly. So we don't mark any of our corneas. We just use the OCT to tell uh, which way it's oriented. And now these are the three ways that we see OCT images. Uh, on the left, we have the injection image. Now, the, that's the image that only the surgeon sees, and it's turned on and off with a foot switch. So you only turn it on when you need it. In the upper right is the image that's uh, on the monitor attached to the microscope. That's where we program the OCT. And down below is the wall monitor that has a normal video image, and it has the OCT inset. And that's really what you see in talks. And those images of the OCT are always on, but the injection image the surgeon sees is only on when they turn it on and off. Now, this is what you can do with DSEC. If you look at the uh, two coaxial microscope images, you don't see a difference. But in the upper right, you can see there's a space between the donor and the recipient. In the lower left, you don't. And that's because we massage the fluid out until it's gone. We don't use venting incisions anymore. Now this image shows a trifold that I've injected and I use trifold techniques for my DMEC for the last few years. And if you look at the uh, inset, you can see how it's curled upward on the edge. So on the right side, the trifold is unfolded and it's curled correctly. And once we see that, then we can just move along. And I'm gonna show this in a video now this is a fakic eye, so there's a scleral tunnel, and I have an AC maintainer, and that keeps the anterior chamber formed while we're putting the donor in, and also it keeps you from getting fibrin formation and other difficulties like blood that can accumulate from the PI. So we're going to uh, get the cartridge to go through the uh, scleral tunnel into the eye, and we're going to inject the donor until it goes all the way across the anterior chamber. We do all of these cases under topical anesthesia. <clears throat> and now we'll start to inject it. And we leave the AC maintainer on as long as we're injecting. Now, once the donor gets to the far side of the angle, to the nasal side, then we'll stop the AC infusion and usually pull the AC maintainer out of the eye so that the anterior chamber collapses at that point 
and holds the donor in place. And you can see it start to unfold. And if you look at the inset closely, you can see where it's curled upward in the correct way. And so, like I said, we don't mark any of our donors. Now, this works very well through very thick cloudy corneas, as you see here. You can see that once again, it's a trifold where the right side is unfolded and you can see it's curled correctly. And the left side, it hasn't uncurled all the way, but we can use the OCT not only to tell how it's oriented, but where it's positioned and to make sure it's centered correctly in these very cloudy corneas. Uh, I'm just gonna end up, even though I'm talking about endothelial keratoplasty, the big game changer for this is with anterior lamellars. And we see three steps here. The first step, we've done a cut down, but it's not deep enough, it's still too thick. And in the upper right, it's thin. And when we get a nice thin dissection like that, we can do a peel technique and the visual results and all the results are just as good as a big bubble. And so it's greatly enhanced our ability to do uh, deep anterior lamellar grafts. So once again, uh, thank you for letting me talk about this. I think this is an innovation that's going to be used more and more with complicated anterior segment surgery. These are the three ways that it's viewed. And right now, only the hog strike unit has the ability to have such a good image in the oculars that you can look uh, without looking away at the monitor and operate with the view that you see. And uh, thanks a lot for letting me join in this uh, renowned group of uh, presenters. Thank you, Frank. Again, an, a wonderful innovation. And I, I think that you know, using technology to help us uh, be more efficient in surgery and safer in surgery is, is definitely the future. I don't think I could ever do a DMEC without seeing the S mark <laughs> personally. Um, and so I, you know, until I have this technology, I, I would have to stick with that. I think you used to refrain from marking even before you had the intraoperative OCT. Is that correct? That's correct. I always, you know, you lose a few endothelial cells doing that. And we actually do all of our own donor preps. And so, uh, yeah, it's just easier not to mark. Okay, well, so what we're going to do is now start the panel discussion. So thank you to all the speakers. Fabulous, fabulous talks. And I, I learned a lot. Now, what we're going to do first is just start with the results of the panel uh, of the poll question. And the question again, to remind you all was which surgical technique for the treatment of Fuchs dystrophy do you feel the most comfortable performing? And the answer is DSEC 45%, DMEC 25%, DSO 15%, and PDEC 15%. So it's interesting, people definitely feel still more comfortable performing DSEC. Um, and I wanted to just ask our, our speakers, if you had Fuchs dystrophy yourself, which procedure would you have on your own eye? So I want to ask each, each of our um, uh, speakers and our wonderful panelists, Professor Sinha, also, which would you actually have? So let's start um, with uh, Frank, since he just finished his talk, what, which, which procedure would you have in your own eye? Uh, you know, right now I'd probably go with DMAC, uh, although DSO uh, in the right patient seems to work well. Uh, but we have a lot of long-term data with DMEC, and obviously I feel comfortable doing it, but I think it'd be one of those two. A uh, DSEC was great, but it's kind of like an extra cap compared to FACO. Uh, it's certainly easier to do, um, and it takes a, a, you have to do more volume to get good at it, and I think that's one of the problems. If you're not doing a large volume, then you should do whatever's best in your hands, and for most surgeons, that's probably still DSEC. Okay, Professor Sinha, same question. Which procedure would you have in your own eye? Well, for me, uh, my preference will be DMEC. And uh, I have seen uh, Susan and Dr. Amar doing a lot of PDEX and I've just started doing it. So perhaps I may not be in that position to say, but maybe with time, uh, I may be in a position to compare DMEC versus PDEC more accurately. And we are doing a study actually as well. As far as the DSEC is concerned, it is uh, perhaps the poll answers uh, are maximally towards DSEC because it is 
people find it easier to do it is uh, an ultra thin desec has some advantage of you know if we go thinner it gives some advantage of uh, providing better quality of vision as well but definitely it can't be compared with uh, dmac so uh, my choice first will be dmac and of course uh, yeah okay thank you susan thanks deep uh well, uh, I think uh, I would uh, go with PDEC, but I'm very intrigued by DSO as well because uh, it takes away the chances of rejection completely. Uh, even though PDMEC and PDEC both have an extremely low rate of rejection. So that's something I think we need to wait and see. But hopefully, if I do need uh, endothelial transplantation, it would be some time off. And I would possibly have the option of doing a cultured endothelial cell transplantation from some cells taken from my own cornea and <laughs> some repasadil or something like that. And I wouldn't have to do any of these other procedures. <laughs> See, thinking outside the box, it wasn't even an option <laughs> question. And she comes up with an answer, not even <laughs> uh, uh, <laughs> as a choice. So Sam, how about you? Yeah, as Su Susan uh, was one step ahead of me. I would do what Susan would do uh, in general. Whatever she's going to do, I'm going to do. Yeah. So, uh, um, but no, if, if it was right now, I would do a DMEC. Uh, in the future, hopefully, we'll have uh, other options for us. And you know, there's a lot of there's a lot of work being done on that. So we'll see where that goes. It's very very exciting. Okay, I I know what Greg's going to say, but let's just hear him say it. <laughs> Go ahead, Greg. I, I well, look, I I think I'd say you know yeah I I think if you if I was the right candidate for a DSO, that's definitely what I would have first. Absolutely. Um, but if, um, if I was the wrong candidate, I would want to be worked up really well. I would want to know exactly what my cells were, were looking like. I might even want to know what my trinucleotide repeat load was. But if I knew all of that and I thought I was a good candidate, I would go for DSO. And if I wasn't, I'd go for DMEC, but I'd make one of you guys do it. <laughs> okay. Okay. You know, DSO, um, I'll answer what I would have. Um, I would actually have a DSO as well because I have been absolutely floored by these results. And again, it's all about patient selection. And so I, I think that you know having corneal clarity without the chance of rejection and you know no issues with positioning has been really uh, advantageous. The downside is the prolonged visual recovery. So, so Greg, in in your best cases, you know how fast can those cells come back uh, with Reposidil? Can you just go over if you were going to tell us, you know, what should the dosing of Reposidil be? When should they start it? How long? What's the optimal? How can you make this recovery faster? I think um, there's a well, there's a multi-center trial right now in progress, which we'll get the results from soon, comparing two drops to four to to zero. I think, as you know, deep and. So that, that'll answer that question with more clarity. But <clears throat> what, I, what I do now is um, uh, immediately once the surgery is done, I, 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 a dropper of Pazidil goes on the eye in the operating theater. Then they stay on um, a four drop a day dose until corneal clearance. The mean time for clearance, what I tell them to expect is around four weeks, but it might be longer. Um, what's the fastest I've ever seen? Uh, like 10 uh, before the second week visit uh, to have a clear cornea is the quickest I've ever seen. The um, uh, and how long do you wait? The longest I've ever seen on a in a repositorial patient is about twelve weeks to clearance. But in that time, you're right. Between the fourth week and the twelfth week, if you've got a slow responder, um, you kind of uh, you just need to sort of tap out to a DMEC with some to provide you and the patient with some clarity. So I thought any patient that I like booking for this surgery, I say and I think I've mentioned this before, DMEC must not be presented as the bad guy, as like a, as a, as a failure, has to be presented as a, as a great alternative option that might, we might have to go to. And then if the patient has the patience and, and if they're a retired patient with nothing else to do and they're really invested in it, they might want to wait that 12 weeks. If they're, if they're really a young professional and they need to get on with their life, then you might just go to a DMEC sooner. I, I agree. Uh, and, and the one thing that we insist on is the patient has to have a very well-functioning fellow eye. So oftentimes I'll do DMEC in the first eye, get them recovered, and then go to the second eye and, and do a DSO. So they have one eye that can, can see very, very well. Excellent. And I, I think we might be out of time. Unfortunately, this has been such a fabulous session. Thank you to 
all of you for, for really educating us and teaching us your innovative pearls in endothelial keratoplasty. And, and thank you to Ashvin Agarwal and Sergio Canabrava for really organizing this worldwide event of, of really just amazing education and some entertainment. So <laughs> thanks so much. Thank you so much, guys. And, and really, bottom of my heart, thank you. Uh, thank you, thank you, thank you. And thanks, let's move on. Thank you so much. Uh, let's move on with the program. We have our next session coming up, uh, which is the Iris Repairers. Let's move. Thank you, guys. Singapore and Brandon Aries, USA. We welcome the panelists. Maria Soledad Romero, USA. And featuring the speakers. Masayuki Akimoto, Japan. Ahmed Asaf, Egypt. Nicole Fram, USA. And Bruno Trindade, Brazil. Organizers Sergio Canabrava, Brazil and Ashvin Agarwal, India Thank you very much uh, and welcome everybody to the Iris Repairers session. I think this is a topic that is very, very close to my heart as well uh, as you know, it's been uh, quite a while that uh, iris has been repaired, but it, it has just become a big boom in the past five years, uh, if you look at it. And, uh, and and I couldn't have asked two better moderators than Brandon Aris and Chi Sun Fake to come and, you know, take the show and show us uh, what the updates are from the iris repair in the world. Thank you so much, guys, for doing this, everybody. All right, guys. Well, thank you so much for joining us for Iris Repair. I'm joined by Chi Soon Fake as our moderator and uh, Maria Soledad Romero is going to be one of our panelists. And we've collected some of the best Iris Repair surgeons uh, really in the world with Matsuyuku uh, Akimoto, uh, Dr. Asef, Nicole Fram, Bruno Trindade. And we're, I think they're going to really blow our minds here over the next few minutes. But we wanted to start out with a question just to assess the audience about what you would do if you encountered an iatrogenic iris defect during surgery. So if you'll join us in our, our, our poll, what would you do if you encountered an iris defect? Would you repair that iris defect during that same surgery at that same sitting? Would you just simply defer the iris repair and let that go to somebody else or leave it, let it sit for another day? Defer it and then repair it yourself later as opposed to a referral or just leave it alone and not repair it at all? So as we're going through, answer those questions and we'll get to this answer down the, down the road uh, during our discussion. But we want to get right to some of the action because we don't have that much time. So starting our session is going to be Dr. Matsuyuki Akimoto talking about iridodialysis repair using a trivet. Hi, everyone. Today, I will talk about iridodialysis repair using rivets. Today, we have mix, mix, mips various kinds of minimally invasive surgeries. In cases with inadequate capsular support, we used to suture the IOL, but now we prefer flanging IOL haptic after Yamane reported his great technique. Kanabrava applied double flanged polypropylene suture to fix CTR complex. How about the iris surgery? 
eye surgery looks like the final labyrinth because the tissue is too fragile to handle with narrow surgical field it's between cornea and lens so we need to take care of them no direct view and less opportunity to get out from this labyrinth we applied double flanged polypropylene suture that is riveting what is rivet? Rivet is a metal pin used to fasten flat pieces of metal or leather. Short flanged polypropylene suture to fasten square and iris looks like a rivet. So we call this technique as riveting. I will show you some representative cases. We use six of polypropylene suture for this purpose. At first, we make Branch at one end, it's about 30 mm in length to make a big ball. And flatten using needle holder to make it much wider. We use Utasin 30 gauge needle to pierce the iris. And pass through the cornea using another needle as a guidance. Then, prepared polypropylene suture was inserted into the orifice. Once enough lengths are inserted, the needle was pulled over. Then, the suture will be left. Do the same thing as many as needed. Pierce the iris. Pass through the cornea and suture was introduced. The lengths are adjusted. Finally, and the ends are flanged. This is another case. So flange the polypropylene suture was set using ultra thin 30 gauge needle. Do the same thing again. Flange the suture was set and length adjusted. Finally flanged. The result looks okay, but recently exposure of the flange is an issue. To overcome this complication, we extend the square tunnel. I will show you another video. 30 gauge needle again to make uh, another square tunnel posteriorly. Suture was inserted into the needle to bury it, to be buried in the square tunnel. And then flange here. So the flange moves much posteriorly. That is far enough to avoid exposure and a thick tenor capsule. Here is a summary. Process are quick procedure, of course not less, cons are long term outcome is still not known. We have experience up to 12 months, but it's not enough. Ultra thin 30 gauge needle is preferred. You may use 27 gauge needle, but in case you must make much bigger flanges to avoid illusion. Probably it's not good for atrophic iris. Recently, Rosenberg reported his beautiful technique in combination of sewing technique and double flange technique. It was to watch. Thank you for watching. Thank you very much, Dr. Akamoto. That was really a very innovative technique and something that I really want to, you know, be practicing on Monday when I go back to surgeries. So next, I'd like to introduce to you uh, our next speaker, Dr. Ahmad Asaf, and he's really wonderful. I've watched him present in several conferences and I'm really impressed by the numerous challenging cases that he tackles in his practice. So, uh, Prof. Ahmad, please tell us about the Sylvia cases. Where do I start? 
Thank you very much for the invitation. I'm honored to be here in this mega event. As you know, iris defects are usually complex and associated with other ocular comorbidity. As you can see in this case with traumatic mendriasis, neglected aphakia, and summer ring, I had to start by doing limited anterior vitrectomy followed by explantation of the summer ring and implantation of a three-piece IOL fixed to the sclera before addressing the traumatic mendriasis. Here I employed the single pass for throw pupilloplasty with 10 ophrolein suture to bring the pupil down. Two sutures were enough to have a reasonable size pupil to cover the edge of the optic of the IOL. Maybe we can add a third suture to cover peripheral iris defect if required. This is another case of fixed dilated pupil after implantation of posterior chamber fecal lens and the case was complicated by urid zavalia syndrome and the patient asked for explantation of the lens. Here I employed the pupil circulage technique and as you can see I left the fecal lens in place to act as a shield to protect the crystalline lens while doing the pupil circulage. And you can see that the technique uh, of pupilloplasty with pupil circulage is much more demanding compared to the single pass for through pupilloplasty. And before tightening the sutures, I explanted the lens, and after explantation of the uh, fake lens, I tightened the suture to bring the pupil down. And as you can see, the pupil was not quite regular because of the areas of atrophic iris tissues. However, the patient was pleased by the visual and the cosmetic outcomes. This is another case of massive iridal lenticular dialysis uh, with fixed dilated pupil and I started here by addressing the sublaxed cataract by explantation of the lens through posterior assisted levitation technique and after explantation of the lens I had to address the massive iris dialysis in the inferior quadrant which extend to beyond 180 degrees. This is partial thickness scleral groove made 2 mm behind the limbus in the inferior quadrant and I used the sewing machine technique by threading 10 ochroline suture through 27 gauge needle and by passing the needle through the periphery of the iris to through the sclera to emerge through the partial thickness sclera groove I externalized the loop on the sclera surface and I made the maneuver at several locations so I externalized several loops and by tightening the ends together we can bring the iris back to the sclera and this is followed by implantation of a three-piece iris followed and fixed to the sclera and now I employ the single pass for through pupil plasty to bring the pupil down and to address such a huge traumatic mendriasis and because of the areas association with areas of iris defects at the pupillary margin I had to place several single pass for through pupilloplasty to have a reasonable size pupil to cover the edge of the optic and here I placed four single pass for through pupilloplasty at the pupillary margin followed by another four single pass for, uh, for through pupilloplasty at the mid uh, periphery of the iris to cover peripheral iris defects and this is one of the merits of the single pass for through pupilloplasty because we can add as many sutures as we want to cover the iris defects and to have a reasonable size pupil. Fortunately, I live in places where the people have a dark colored iris, so minor deformities of the pupil are not noticeable by uh, naked eye in everyday life. And sometimes the iris defects are so large, so we have to uh, use the iris prosthesis, as you can see in this case with massive iris defect in the inferior quadrant with the sublaxed cataractus lens due to trauma. Here I had to address the cataract and fix the capsule through it to the sclera with implantation of capsule tension segment fixed to the scleral pocket with a 9 ophrolene suture and after fixing the lens capsule implantation of a single piece IOL and this is the standard brown iris prosthesis made of silicone I made small trim in the inferior quadrant to provide some space for the suture fixing the uh, capsule tension segment to the sclera. We don't have injector dedicated for implantation of such devices inside the eye so we may uh, use the injectors dedicated for three-piece IOL to implant the device. Here I place the, the prosthesis inside the anterior chamber ferrous and after complete unfolding of the prosthesis 
um, I had the two um, tuck the prosthesis under the iris tissue to place it in the sulcus. Uh, you may notice the difference between the color of the prosthesis and the color of the iris of the patient because this is the standard brown prosthesis. We didn't use the custom made because of the financial issues. So here, as you can see the difference here in the color, however, the patient was very pleased by the visual outcomes because the difference in the color was not very noticeable with everyday life. So my conclusion here that large iris defects are usually complex and associated with other ocular comorbidity. Single pass fourth row pupilloplasty is technically easier compared to pupil circulage. Peripheral iris defects should be managed first followed by pupilloplasty and sometimes iris prosthesis is necessary in cases with massive tissue defects. Thank you very much for your attention. Holy cow, that was uh, some pretty amazing surgery. Uh, we're gonna we're gonna unpack some questions about that later on in the session. But I now get the honor of introducing one of my one of my best friends, uh, best friends professionally and probably even outside that, Nicole Fram. And Nicole's gonna give us a talk uh, entitled "Some Like It Hot, and Others Prefer Symmetry." So, uh, Nicole, take it away. Okay, great. Well, thank you so much for inviting me to be here to the moderators and to Sergio and Ashvin. It's just a pleasure to be here. We're gonna talk about various different ways to manage iris defects. So this is a patient who had a congenital um, cataract. We performed a secondary IOL placement with intraskeletal haptic fixation. There's about three clock hours of uh, iris defect here. And we're kind of taking our micro forceps to feel if we can actually approximate this. And we're gonna do a seepser sliding knot here. And we used a 10 polypropylene on a CTC needle, and you can come out anywhere in the cornea when you do that. And so there are wonderful techniques. There's actually YouTube videos by Brandon um, on how to perform the seepser uh, sliding knot technique. And here you just wanna take your time and make sure you're approximating this tissue. But what we see here is that the iris is too superior and it's not necessarily perfectly round. So for all the OCD perfectionists in the world, um, we can use intraocular 25 gauge um, diathermy. And this was brought to us by Ike Ahmed from Canada years ago. And finally, it's gonna be published uh, in JCRS soon, but we can use that to kind of pull the iris inferiorly. And then we can see how many more bites we need to take of the iris. So here we're going to use the condon snare before we use the bond hook. Um, the condon snare is made by MST and it's a wonderful way to grab um, this uh, polypropylene suture. And here now you can see that because we knew how to move the iris into the proper or the pupil into the proper location, we're now going to finish up the case with a perfectly uh, round and well-centered uh, pupil here. So this technique has helped in many circumstances to actually move the iris and move the pupil to where we want it. This next case is a patient with albinism. Patient has nystagmus and some foveal hypoplasia, um, but has about 2080 uh, potential. So what we need to do here is get this cataract out and we wanna plan for an in the bag human optics artificial iris. Now, when we make our capsular excess, it has to be at least 5.5 to 6 millimeters in order to get the device in. So it's a really important point. The next thing is that we want to clean everything up really nicely, restain with Tripan Blue, make sure that we get all um, the bubbles out, and then go ahead and put a CTR in. If you don't put a CTR in when you're putting an artificial iris in the bag, uh, then you can get uh, fibrosis and um, it can cause kinking of the iris over time. We put the lens in, we get everything out from underneath, and then we measure, and this is with the Snyder ruler. Um, I usually start, you know, when I first start putting it in the bag, measure about nine millimeters. This is a uh, trepanation um, application by um, Epsilon. So Mateen helped me make this uh, with Sam Maskett. We do a trifold technique in a silver series. And we place this artificial iris within the cartridge. So we're going through a 2.7 to 3 millimeter incision. That tripan blue is helping us because we can see that iris getting into the capsule 
We use two Kuglin hooks to kind of unfold it. And then we do this kind of trifold um, or overfold technique to get the iris uh, into the bag. And so that decreases the effective diameter. Um, so you see here, um, when we do this technique, it gets into the bag nicely. Um, and then you're left with a patient that has an in the bag placement of an artificial iris. Uh, this next patient had a lens in the sulcus that was causing chafing, but really liked the lens. So we're just gonna place this lens into an optic capture position. So this is now an example of how we can use the human optics artificial iris for um, transillumination defects that are diffuse. We could passively put this in the sulcus, but this patient already showed me that she has pigment dispersion. So I'd like to kind of suture it to the sclera to make sure we don't have any issues in the future. So this is the same uh, way that we um, trephinate, but then we're gonna use 7-0 uh, Gore-Tex. Many people call it 8-0 Gore-Tex, but it's 7-0 on a TTC9 uh, needle. We're gonna trifold that. We used to have to put this in a nine millimeter incision, but now we can actually put this through the cartridge preloaded with the Gore-Tex and keep our incision size at three millimeters. It's a little bit of spaghetti, um, but if you can keep track of your sutures, we can then suture this uh, about 2.5 millimeters posterior to the limbus and three millimeters apart on each side. And we have this nice technique where we stay small incision and we can get this iris in front of the IOL. The IOL underneath always has to be secured. So it has to be in the bag or it has to be suture fixated or optic captured. We bury the knots and the ends so they don't get extruded. And then we're left with this beautiful case and the patient uh, had no um, transillumination defects that were causing problems anymore because the iris was there. And so all of these cases demonstrate the complex techniques, whether it's small, um, iris surgical management or larger surgical management um, to assist us with helping these patients. These human optics artificial irises do not go in the anterior chamber. They always have to be in the sulcus, um, either sutured, passive fixation, or in the bag. Thank you so much. Really hot stuff, Nicole. Thank you so much. Splendid surgery. I love the way you inject the artificial iris with the sutures. Really cool. All right, now let's move on to our fourth and final speaker. And uh, Bruno Trinidad is going to do it really differently and he's going to tell us how. Bruno, please. Hi, everyone. Um, before I start, I'd like to thank uh, the opportunity of presenting in this amazing uh, meeting with such a esteemed panelists. And I'll be showing a few uh, devices that I have uh, no financial in interest in any of them. So I'd like to start with this very dramatic case of this 22 year old guy that had a PK done in his right eye to treat his keratoconus back in 2009. And despite of a very good initial result, uh, he had a blunt trauma with the volleyball a few years later that led to an iris and lens loss. And in his initial presentation to us, he was complaining of poor vision and extreme light sensitivity. This guy could not withstand daylight. And this was his vision with an aphakic refraction. It improved to 2050, but uh, it, it was quite a, a kind of unpredictable refraction. And despite all these uh, happenings, uh, he still had a, a clear graft and a relatively uh, regular topography. So this, we decided to address this case using this very large and old uh, PMMA single piece lens made by Morcher. It has a five millimeter central optical zone with a 10 millimeter pseudo iris. And uh, we started surgery by making two opposite sides uh, sclero grooves, uh, uh, partial sclerotomies. And then we inserted this very large lens using a, uh, a scleral incision. And after securing the, the incision, we sutured the, the implants to the sclera using Gore-Tex suture. It is important to point out that all the Gore-Tex material needs to be buried within the sclera. It should not be left under the conge. And 
After doing that, we closed the, the wound, uh, glued the conch back down with fibrin glue. And this is uh, kind of the aspect of the eye at the end of the procedure. And here we can see in the day after surgery, uh, one month later, and this same eye uh, a year after surgery. And this patient was very happy with the result. Not only did his vision improve quite significantly, more, more than what we believed it could be, but uh, his uh, uh, light sensitivity sy uh, symptoms were completely vanished after surgery. So he was very happy with the final outcome of this procedure. And um, in this second case, it's sort of a similar case. It's a 39-year-old teacher that had a PK done on her left eye to treat a, a corneal scarring due to HSV uh, infection. And uh, during surgery, apparently, she had a traumatic uh, iatrogenic iridodialysis. And again, on her initial presentation to us, she was also complaining of poor vision and uh, light sensitivity, as you can see here. Uh, and uh, her vision was limited to 2050 on account to a irregular corneal astigmatism. So we decided to take a, a slightly different approach in this case. So before we started, we secured the loose iris segment with a single iris hook, and then we performed a manual capsule rexis, and then a phaco aspiration of the lens. This was very soft lens, a very young patient. Uh, we switched to the IA handpiece to remove the cortex. And then we implanted a single piece monofocal IOL in the capsular bag. And on top of that, we used the extra focus pinhole device, uh, which is a small aperture diaphragm that is intended to be placed in the ciliary sulcus. And with that, we were hoping to treat not only her light sensitivity, but also to improve her vision. And we felt comfortable enough not to tackle the iris itself. So we left the iris as it was before surgery. And you can see here on the day after surgery, uh, here a week later, and also uh, two and a half years after surgery, this patient was also very uh, excited, very happy. We we're very pleased with the results. Her vision had, had improved quite significantly and her light sensitivity was eliminated by this procedure without ever having to touch the iris uh, itself. So with that, I conclude my presentation and I thank you once again for your attention and for the opportunity of presenting here uh, with you. Thank you. All right, Bruno, thank you so much for those really cool surgical videos. A lot of unique techniques there. I appreciate it. Let's go over the results of our audience poll. And I think uh, I actually find this kind of uh, surprising. So 80, a little over 80% of our respondents said that they would do an iris repair at the time of surgery. Remember, the question was, when encountering an iatrogenic iris defect, would you repair it right there? Would you... Uh, defer and refer, defer forever. There are a few options. So 80 plus percent said I'd fix it right at the time that I saw the defect or during the surgery. About 11% said we're just going to defer the iris repair for uh, later. A smaller number, only 7% said I'm going to not do this myself. I'm going to refer someplace else. And nobody said I'm not going to do anything about this. Everybody would at least uh, refer it to somebody for repair. So clearly with 80% saying, I'm gonna fix this at the time, we've got an experienced group of surgeons watching this, uh, watching this webinar. So I'm gonna kick this over to, um, to, to Maria as our panelist. Maria, with these results, is, is this what you see you know, in your practice as well? Do you find this surprising or does this result kind of sound like what you thought it would be? Maria, could you take that question? I, I lost, yeah, sorry. sorry, I lost connection. Uh, hi, no, no, I think I was uh, I was expecting an answer like that. I think lately, you know, uh, Irish repair and it's becoming like a very, uh, you know, more common, you know, in all the type of uh, the surgeons. 
uh, regarding to the uh, speakers, one of wonderful and engaging um, presentations, all of you, I have just a couple of questions. The first is, uh, how do you size the iris prosthesis? Uh, I'll take this one. So if it's in the bag, um, you can use that Snyder ruler and then take the um, radius and multiply it. So basically you take it to the Purkinje image uh, that you see off the corneal reflex. And so if it's like 4.5, you just multiply it by two and do a nine. I think when you're starting out with in the bag, start out with nine or 9.5 until you get used to doing the overfold to put it in the bag and make sure that Rexus is 5.5 to six millimeters. That's key. Um, and the CTR in the back. In terms of suturing, um, when you're just doing scleral fixation with a scleral uh, fixated IOL, then you just take the white to white minus one millimeter. That's what I do. Uh, I don't know if Brandon has other techniques and Dr. Asaf. So then, um, when you're uh, putting passive fixation, so let's say you have a natural iris there and then you just want to passively fixate it because they have transillumination defects or other issues or small iris defect, there's a little controversy there. Um, if it's a normal size eye, Kevin Miller, Mike Snyder, they're you say I'm asking, champions of this technique. Um, we're doing just, we're not trepanating and just putting it in at the 12.8 diameter. Um, but if it's a small eye, you must trepanate. Um, so all these patients need to be counseled that if we're doing passive fixation, there is a chance that I need to take this out uh, because we don't know who is going to get some pigment dispersion. I know we've seen this internationally. Wonderful, wonderful. And one last question, and I think it's going to be uh, direct to you. Uh, you mentioned in one of the videos that you use the diode laser to reshape the uh, pupil. So when you apply the uh, laser, uh, or some people apply the cautery, do you do it closer to the, the mid, uh, closer to the pupil or closer to the iris roof? The closer you get to the pupil, the more effect. So be careful. So you can start a little bit, about a millimeter away, just to get a feel for what that iris is gonna do. And the setting on the cautery should be at 10 and should be under OVD. Okay, wonderful, wonderful. So, you know, Bruno, we got a question from the, the attendees about visualizing the fundus through a, uh, you know, an iris prosthesis or an iris prosthesis IOL. Have you had any issues you know, looking at the fundus through those, uh, those implants? Well, I guess or, that- Or anybody on the panel? So they're, they're asking more specific about the extra focus because it's, it, it is definitely a small aperture device. And yes, it, it can get tricky to visualize fundus, but this implant itself has a, a, a interesting property of being transparent to infrared light. So we tend to use an, an, op, an infrared light operating uh, machine such as an OCT to visualize the, the, the retina and this can be easily performed. And Dr. Akimoto, a question came through for you about how much of that proline suture do you expose on the sclera to make sure you have adequate length for a, a bulb that's not going to pull through? Yeah, uh, in my case, I use six of polypropylene. So that uh, I think uh, just a few mil, two to three millimeters is enough to make a uh, branch outside. Is that okay? Okay. Hmm. Yeah, thank you. And then there's another question. They, they're, they're rolling in pretty quickly here on the, the chat box. Uh, so I'll direct this to Nicole because it, it was uh, it came through during your talk, but anybody can also answer. When we're putting so many implants in the capsular bag, an IOL, a CTR, an artificial iris, have we had any issues with capsular distension uh, syndrome or retained OVD in the capsular bag? Nicole, why don't you start that off and then we'll, anybody else can answer. I don't want to talk too much. Uh, so I haven't had any problems with that, but you notice in the video that I put the lens in and then I went underneath uh, the IOL, took the OVD out, stained the capsule again. Uh, so I think it, it's really important to kind of take out as much OVD as possible before you then put more cohesive. You can just put cohesive because it comes out easily um, when you're putting the actual implant in the bag. Um, the, 
the thing that happens is that everything kind of pushes back. And so you may want to aim, you know, a little bit more myopic or give the, give the lens a little bit more power because you may end up with a hyperopic outcome. And that's another thing to consider. I don't know uh, if Dr. Asaf has anything to say about that. Uh, I agree with you, but uh, I have one case that uh, the bag was torn by the implant itself. Maybe after transformation, the sharp edge of the uh, silicone, I'm not sure of that, that was uh, caused a tear in the, in the equator of the bag while implanting the bag after implantation of the lens, and this will complicate the surgery to a help. So that's why I prefer as a first choice to do the sulcus implantation, whether as Kevin Miller mentioned that without trephination or sometimes with trephination, if the white to white is so small as you have just mentioned, but my first choice in all the cases that sulcus implantation, if not feasible, maybe I have to go for the in bag implantation with cautious, but you did very well, actually. Thank you. All right, we only have about a minute or two left for our panel discussion. And Dr. Asaf, something that I, I saw you do in your video, when you were doing your iridodialysis repair, uh, I think just naturally I would have approached an iris defect, or I do approach the iris defect, especially with the dialysis, from the anterior surface of the iris, then going through the sclera. You actually approach that from the posterior side of the iris, which I thought was pretty unique and also pretty cool. Uh, is that something that you just, that's just how you do it? Or is there a reason that you approach that from the posterior aspect of the iris? I found it is easier to approach the, the iris defects or the iridal dialysis from the posterior surface of the iris because the dialysis was so huge in this case and similar other cases. So you can just start from the posterior surface of the iris and directly to out of the sclera. And with the sewing machine technique, there is no issues with the, that the tear, that the proline might uh, cheese wire through the iris tissue, but I found that it's more comfortable, comfortable to me. I mean, that was- Akimoto, Could I oh, ask Dr. Akimoto a question? Um, it's with regard to the needles um, that you use, you're using a 30 gauge and it has to be a thin walled needle, right? Yes. Yes, because that, otherwise the protein 6 all cannot get through it. Uh, of course, 27 gauge needle, uh, uh, 6 or polypropylene can through it, but uh, 30 gauge needle, you need to use ultra thin. Right. Ultra thin gauge, yes. Yeah, because I've tried it with a 30 gauge standard wall needle, and the 6 O doesn't get through. Okay. And so, technique uh, of thing, I had a problem that the hole uh, by the 27 gauge in the iris was a little okay. too large. Yeah, and that yeah. flange had to be pretty big, so that mm -hmm. didn't. Yeah. Okay. So, oh. Sorry oh, about that. <laughs> uh, yeah, and and uh, the needle I used was a little bit longer, so nine, 19 millimeters. So that's why I can pass the cornea. So the needle is very good for this purpose. Very important, Paul. Thank yeah. you. Okay, I think, uh, we're just really out of time now. And uh, it just leads me to thank our speakers for their wonderful talks and uh, Brendan and Maria for fantastic discussion. And uh, special thanks to Ashvin and Sergio for making this happen. And uh, I personally have learned a lot from this session and I just can't wait to get hold of my next iris defect to repair it. So let's move on to the next session, which is the Film Festival Show. Thank you, everyone. Bye, guys. Bye. Bye. Thank you. There are a billion people on this planet living with vision problems, people being held back from reaching their full potential. And for those who do get treatment, far too often the results fail to reach their expectations. As leaders in the industry, we have the responsibility and the power to change this because being able to see is one thing. It's quite another to see brilliantly. We stand on the precipice of incredible opportunity to transform the way people see and experience the world. Not just to clinically improve ocular health, but to usher in a brave new age of vision. Because in today's world, vision has never been more important. It has the power to connect us, inspire us, empower us, 
and create joy. Gracias, doctor. Agradezco que que ya vi happy was like Manta. This is our mission: to help people see brilliantly is to help us all see new opportunities and new ways of doing things. To help open the eyes of a billion people across the world to the awe in the everyday. To enable that incredible feeling when everything suddenly looks brighter, bolder, more extraordinary, and full of more possibilities than they could possibly ever imagine. Because when people see brilliantly, they live brilliantly. Alcon, see brilliantly. And now, the WWCRS 2021 presents the WWCRS Film Festival Award Show with the categories Best in Cataract Video, Best in Complex and Challenging Cases, Best in Other Specialty best of the best, and grand prize. Introducing our judges. Gaurav Luthra, India. Kathleen McCabe, USA. And Susan McDonald, USA. Bringing on our moderator on stage, Ashavin Agarwal, India. Lay back and let's enjoy the show. Welcome. Welcome, everybody, for the first World Film Festival Awards show. And I want to make sure that everybody is safe and I hope that everybody is safe in their clinics, homes, wherever you are watching this. And I want you to sit back and enjoy this. I want to start with a small thank you. A thank you to ASCRS that has been a huge inspiration for both Sergio and I to create this Film Festival Award Show. It's been such a pinnacle body of films and education in ophthalmic space that probably you know, explains a lot more deeper of how we all ophthalmologists come together because of films like this, the events they make, the events that film festival ASCRS has become, it's huge. And it is such a tribute for me to host an event like this and bring to you a lot of films and ophthalmic films that have been submitted to the World Film Festival Award Show. Having said that, I want to first things first, raise a toast to all the producers of everybody who submitted a film this year. So thank you so much for doing that. We've got close to 100 films this year, and I want to make sure that everybody feels a winner, regardless of the results. And some housekeeping items. The judges had to make a few changes to the categories. We had to merge one of them that was the other specialty and the cornea refractive. So we have one category that is the best in other specialty instead of two. The other housekeeping items are there is going to be a winner's award of Amazon gift cards of worth of $100 for each winner. There's also going to be a grand prize, which we'll come to very soon. Now, without any further ado, I really want to, and I have to call on stage, the three most important and favorite people of mine for this Film Festival Award Show, my judges. Thank you so much for doing this. Can we please have our judges on stay on my screen? I can't say stage anymore. Uh, can we have Kathy McCabe? Can we have Gaurav Lutra and Susan McDonald? Hi guys, thank you so much for doing this. And, uh, you know, at the onset, I, I really have to ask you uh, a question. Uh, you guys have uh, done Film Festival Award judging a lot. I'm sure that in the past. But how has been this experience of doing it so remotely that you don't even get to see each other's face? 
I mean, you don't get to mingle, you don't get to experience the joy that somebody else is judging while they're judging. Oh my God, that's beautiful. Or whatever that is. Can each of you in less than 30 seconds give me that answer? Um, I'll say, why don't I start? And I would say- Sure, thanks. So. Um, it, it, it's a little bit lonely, but it's been a lonely time, right? So, but I have to say it's been an incredible joy. I felt like I was spending five minutes with each of these hundred uh, uh, films, the authors of the films, and they were extraordinary, each and every one of them. And so I, it actually um, became more of an intimate um, experience with those people that were creating their film and just me. And I really spent time focusing on their, um, their expertise and their skill set. I, I thought it was a wonderful experience. Thank you, Susan. Kathy and Gaurav. Um, I'll just add to what Susan said. It was an amazing educational experience. I just, I'm blown away by the production um, acumen of all of the, the people who put together their films. And I hope I learned a little bit about that as well. They were very educational. It was wonderful time spent. And I, I encourage everybody else to, you know, really get into films this way and educate yourself and spend time with the authors. And I wanna say that we did also do a little bit of texting back and forth, like, wow, that was amazing and blew my socks off. So there was a little bit of that. Thank you, Kathy. Gaurav? Yes, Ashwin. So I think uh, it was a different experience. I've been judging festivals and this time, uh, you know, sitting at home and uh, being able to see all the films, you know, sometimes maybe if you wanted to, if you really liked a film, you could see it twice and totally different experience. Yes. And uh, you could spend more time thinking about the films and you could take it easy. You know, sometimes when you're judging over a day or two, you need to rush through the films and, uh, you know, you may not get to see all of it completely. So it was fun and I enjoyed it. It was different. And you guys made it really easy. I think the WWCRS team, backend team really needs appreciation for making it so easy and seamless for us to just click on you know links and be able to see the films at your ease and um, and yes uh, we did manage to you know exchange notes a little bit as well in between uh, with Ashwin facilitating us so it was fun I think and the quality of the films was amazing we really enjoyed it so great job Ashwin Ashwin, I also well, want to say my husband enjoyed watching all of them as well. He is not an <laughs> ophthalmologist, though he feels like he's gone through a residency and a fellowship, but he really enjoyed them. Well, that's lovely. We have one more to join the bandwagon then. Amazing. That's fantastic. Thank you, Susan. Uh, let's move on with the awards show now, guys. And with the first category on stage, we have the best in cataract video. And... Uh, to give away these awards and to present this award, I would love to call on Susan McDonald to uh, be on the spotlight over here. And uh, Susan, uh, you know, before we start with the, announcing the runner up, uh, I wanted to ask you a question. What's been the most funnest or the most difficult part of, uh, you know, judging these films right now? Whatever comes well, I think the most fun has been getting to work with you and Kathy and Gerva. That um, that it's been really nice to have some time with the with the three of you. You've been a little bit of a taskmaster master, so that's been the hardest part for me. <laughs> Thank you, Susan. That that's a real sign of appreciation there. <laughs> And moving on now, we want to call upon Susan to announce the runner-up in the cataract segment. Well, I'm delighted to do this. The cataract section was full. I, I just want to say every one of the films were extraordinary and I learned something from them. So thank you to every one of the candidates. Um, and I want to um, acknowledge the runner-up and congratulations to Gerd Afran the uh, title of the video is Focus on Multifocal and EDOF Technology. Congratulations, Gerd. Runner-up for the best in cataract video category is Gerd Alfart from Germany. With the video, Focus on Multifocal and EDOF Technology.
The images were captured with a digital camera setup. Video films as well as still pictures were assessed. Looking at the analysis, we used specific software for analyzing the light distribution to define the peaks of the near, intermediate and distance or the EDUF range of vision area. Congratulations, Gerd. Susan, don't go anywhere. You still have to announce the winner of the cataract segment. So Susan, can we have the winner as well? Absolutely. I am delighted to announce the winner of the cataract section. It is, the title is Glamorizing M-I-S-I-C-S, -I -I A Faco Surgeon's Envy by Soel Efron Maud Khan. Congratulations. Fabulous, Phil. And now we present the winner for the best in cataract video category. Sohel Irfan Mohammed Khan from India. With the video, glamorizing MSICS, a FACO surgeon's envy. Head to head with a FACO surgeon. While anterior chamber FACO fragmentation is relatively easy, it definitely jeopardizes the endothelial integrity and defeats the very aim of obtaining pristine cornea day one post-operative. We are now presenting a novel, sleek and elegant pre-chopper without a cross-action suit the nucleus of any density. 1.9 millimeter mark is made on the sclera. The new pre-chopper, as described, divides the endonucleus into two halves. Once pie-shaped fragments are obtained, a microvect is, is being now used to remove these fragments from the anterior chamber one by one. After cortical wash, finally, a foldable lens is now being implanted. Congratulations, Sohail. Well Sohail. Done. And you will have your $100 Amazon gift card sent to you. Moving on to the next two. Thank you, Susan, for that. And Can I just say one on more thing, Ashwin? We I've... have the best. Sorry. Go ahead, Susan. Sorry. So uh, we want to know where we can get this chopper. It's extraordinary. <laughs> and before you get to your Amazon, um, $100 gift certificate, you need to share with us how we get the pre-chopper. So Hale, that's a direct challenge to you. So <laughs> there we go. Okay, moving on to the next category, we have the best in complex and challenging cases. And I couldn't think of anybody better but Gaurav Luthra to come away and give away this award. So Gaurav, can we please have you on support like, thank you so much. Um, Gaurav, I have a question. I mean, you've seen close to 100 films uh, just judging this film festival. You always come across two films that are really, really close, you know, and, and you really have this tight battle that you have to choose with one between the other. How do you do it? What do you do? Uh, what's, your, so, what's your mantra? I mean, to so the new judges fact, coming uh, yeah, the, this category actually had the maximum number of films as well. So, and I think I had like, five films which were competing each other not not just two like there were so many good films that there were actually five so it obviously becomes very tough and uh, you know to choose between them but when you have uh, you know some of the best films that uh, people have innovative ideas and you know very good picture making and then their their narration is amazing so of course you know you can always kind of some some films really stand out so i think uh, in the end you know all the judges pooling their uh, you know kind of uh, resources and you know deciding which one is the best always works best and uh, i think uh, it wasn't difficult to make a choice perfect thank you so much gorov and i think that just shows the teamwork that you guys have had in this whole uh, event thank you so much all three of you Moving on to the runner-up in the complex and challenging case category. Gaurav, can we have the runner-up, please? Absolutely. So it's my pleasure to announce the runner-up in this category of uh, complex and challenging cases. Uh, the runner-up is Survival of a Sinking Ship, Innovative Procedure for Subluxated Cataract. Uh, the film was by Dr. Sharifa Zahan Mitu. Excellent film. The runner-up for the best in complex and challenging cases category is 
Sharifa Zahun Mitu from Bangladesh. The video, Survival of a Sinking Ship, Innovative Procedure for Subluxated Cataract. That she had a subluxated grade 4 cataract. Let's see how we can manage this cataract. Rexus is the most important part here to proceed forward. Here I use the capsular tension segment whose eyelet is larger and carved as it is easier to hold and manipulate. A 26 G needle was approached inside one end of the suture is passed through the hole of the CTS and then brought out. Make it cut short and burn one end with the ball cautery. Then bring it out slowly to hook the one end. Then cut short the other end and burn it to make another anchoring edge. And that's my anchor. Thank you, Sharifa, for that, and congratulations. Gaurav, you have the honors to do the winner as well in the complex and challenging cases. Thanks, Ashwin, and I'm uh, very happy to, to announce that the winner in this category is going to be biological encirclage in a case of Travelucy syndrome by Dr. Rahul Kumar Pafna. Again, an amazing film and well-deserved. And the winner for the best in complex and challenging cases category is Raul Kumar Bafna from India. With the video, biological encirclage in the case of Troublesley syndrome. But a spontaneous blip is hard to find and the rarest cause is this genetic disorder. Our patient was a 31 year old lady. The eye had a flat AC because of multiple overfiltering spontaneous blips the superonasal having such a large scleral defect that it became staphylomatous. The stab incision on the staphyloma was then enlarged using Vana's scissors, and the subluxated lens was visco-expressed through the defect. In order to match the curve of the limbus, two wedges of corneal tissue were excised and sutured using monofilament nylon. Post-operatively, the patient performed much better than expected and on serial follow-ups, maintains a vision of 5 by 6. Congratulations and thank you so much, Gaurav, for being a part of this and helping me through this, uh, this category. Let's move on to the next category, that is the other specialties. Now, this is a very challenging category, and I think uh, oh, the one person who does so many challenging things in life is Kathy McCabe, and I couldn't have had anybody better than Kathy to come and present the winners and runner-up in this category. Kathy, I have a funny one for you. I have a funny question for you. Uh, how easy was it to work with me? <laughs> well, I'm going to say, Ash, you are a great surgeon and friend, and it's always a fun adventure doing anything with you, but it is like combining a chinchilla with a tornado. It's irresistible, but as you're drawn into that vortex of activity around you, before you know it, your head is spinning. <laughs> well, so. well I, I'm so happy. I'm so happy that you've uh, you chosen those words to actually define me, but... Yeah, but the, yeah, that's it. I mean, you know, I'm happy to work with you again. <laughs> uh, but yes, let's move on with the runner-up in this category. I can, Kathy, can we please have the runner-up? Uh, I mean, everybody wants to know because this is a big category here. Yeah, and I am delighted to talk about this category just because there were so many and wide variety of um, challenging cases and innovative ideas that were presented. And our runner up for this category is by Arthur Cummings, 12 month results of allogenic corneal inlays for presbyopia. Congratulations, Arthur. The runner up for the best in other specialty category is Arthur Cummings from Ireland. With the video, 12 months results of allogenic corneal inlays for presbyopia. 12 month results of allograft corneal inlays in the treatment of presbyopia with 
the LASIK flap being made, the inlay placed in this loop in fluid onto the corneal surface. As the inlay dries, it becomes a lot more stable on the corneal surface. And once it is no longer moving, the flap can simply be replaced. The edges are dried and then the patient is taken to the slit lamp where it is almost impossible to see that any inlay has been placed. In summary, the biocompatibility has been excellent thus far. It can be combined with other procedures and binocularly, the uncorrected distance vision is basically unchanged. Thank you very much for your attention. Congratulations, Atta, on that award. Moving on to the winner in the other specialties category, can I please call back Kathy again? Yes, Kathy, I'm very excited. Yours. Yeah, there were so many great things, but this, again, a great film, just a wonderful and unique technique and a new device that I think is really going to solve a very large problem globally. So this award goes to Gerd Alfarth, CSI Heidelberg, DMEC with artificial implant instead of human tissue. What a wonderful device and we're excited to have it in our hands. Congratulations. The winner for the best in other specialty category is Kurt Alford from Germany. With the video, CSI Heidelberg, DMAC with artificial implant instead of a human tissue. Which is called EndoArt, and which was developed by a startup company from Israel, which is called ION. It decreases the inflow of aqueous humor into the corneal stroma, and by this, it decreases the corneal edema. It almost looks like a contact lens. It is six millimeter in diameter. It has a dome-shaped form. It is made from a hydrophilic acrylic material, the same material that we use in hydrophilic intraocular lenses. And it is done with a lathe cut procedure. We can say that we have a proof of concept here that it really can decrease corneal swelling and keep the cornea clear. We still have to work on the surgical technique and also look for handling of complication, repositioning and so on. But already we can see that this is a usable solution for patient who need an endothelial procedure and where we have a need for a transplant. Congratulations again, Gerd. I mean, that's a second double whammy for you. Thank you so much, Kathy, for being here and doing all that you do for ophthalmology. Thank you so much, Kathy. Moving to the next category, and probably this is now getting more serious, but the best of the best. So we just have two more big awards left. The best of the best is one of them. And I couldn't think of anybody better than Susan McDonald again to come and do the best of the best category. Susan, I'm not gonna ask you anything this time. I'm just gonna ask you to please present the best of the best award. Well, thank you, Ash. I, I... I'm going to say thank you so much for putting this incredible session together. And I hope you continue doing it year to year. I believe that those who can't travel were able to have an incredible educational experience and it brought us all together in a time that we needed each other. And so thank you so much. The best of the best, it's hard to imagine anything gets better than this. Derval Jr a WW piercing, amazing technology. And the best of the best award in the 2021 WWCRS Film Festival goes to Durval Carvalho Jr. from Brazil. With the video, a WW piercing. Good in complication cases due to posterior capsule rupture is to replace a multifocal or toric single piece intraocular lens as if implanted in the ciliary sulcus. Currently, there are techniques for sclerofixation of single piece intraocular lenses, 
but only for those with a hole in their haptics that allows them to be implanted. But how are premium lenses like Toric and Multifocal that do not have a hole in their design? One solution to this type of complication is the piercing flange technique. This technique is a variation of the Yaman and four flange technique by Sergio Canabrava. This needle is not removed until the 5 proline thread is introduced and is easily inserted into the needle up enough to be rescued. This thread is extruded through the needle recoil, leaving the proline thread through both the haptics and the scleral. The wire's inner end suture tip is heated at its tip, making the flange, which will hold the haptic, preventing the wire from loosening. The thread is trimmed before being heated to finally create the outer flange to be buried in the sclera. The same procedure is performed on the contralateral side. In the final result, we were able to observe well-centered IOL. Well, a big, big congratulations, Durval, for this. It's an amazing video, and I think there's so much to learn from this that there's no giving up. You can always find a way out. And that's what this video teaches you. Um, I would love to actually do not miss these videos. Now, uh, thank you, Susan, for doing that. But I would love to also mention over here, and this is a specific mention from the judges. Uh, these are videos you don't want to miss. If you want to see them, you can always go back to worldwcrs.com and view all the videos all over again. They'll be there on the website for a long period of time. But uh, Kitchen Ophthalmic Surgeon is one uh, kissing MVR technique is another, and IOL scope. I've listed it out here for your viewing, but please don't go uh, without watching these. These, these are exceptional videos, something you can take to your kitchen and use in ophthalmology. But coming back to the main event, let's move on to the grand prize. And the grand prize, I want to call all my three judges to give away the grand prize. There is though a $200 USD uh, Amazon gift card awaiting the winner of this grand prize. Susan, Gaurav, Kathy, uh, why, why do you think this video, let's not reveal the name yet, but why do you think this video deserves the award? What's, what's in it? Each of you. You know, online. this, I, uh... I'm gonna I'm gonna start it off if you don't mind, but uh, yeah. but this video really I mean I was this was the one that I was just so blown away by, because I think the really creative things are when it's low technology that results in a high technology result, and this is something that brings high technology result to anybody anywhere with a very limited number of things that are easily accessible. So I'm I'm super excited to show this to you. And it's creepy too. That's a benefit. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Thank you for that. That's a spoiler alert, guys. <laughs> okay. Uh, Gaurav, do you want to go next? Yes, Ashwin. So I think uh, this video really stands out. It's so simple, uh, almost like so simple to kind of reproduce very cheap to produce and then you know it kind of gives you so much advantage so i think it really stood out and catches your attention right away so i hope i'm not giving it away but i'll pass it on to to susan to finish it off <laughs> well i have to susan. agree with kathy and gaurav this was extraordinary in the fact that we're really taking a a, a very brilliant idea and allowing us to bring a technology where there may not be one. And I just want to say it's extraordinary to see um, that these, the best of the best and the grand prize are really bringing technology to people and abilities and techniques um, that are needed in areas that may not have um, that, uh, these um, techniques right now. Yeah, you, you know, uh, you, you, you guys all say so much, uh, there's so much depth to what you say. I know it, it is less time to explain, but that was something uh, why we even began World uh, Webinar. This whole World Webinar concept actually began because we wanted to take ophthalmology to the doorstep of the people rather than, you know, make it all complex and travel and so many other things that restrict us from moving around. Uh, but yeah, that's almost on the same lines and I, I couldn't have found better people to actually give away the grand prize 
But finally, we have to actually announce the name. So all of you guys, just go for it. Uh, who's, the, who's, the, who's the winner? I'm curious to know. <laughs> well, go ahead, Gar. Gar, ask you, please. Uh -huh. Can I, I will, who will, go ahead, uh -huh. Kathy. <laughs> let Kathy, wow. let Kathy just tell everybody. Great. So it's Prithvi Chandra Kant, and it's Catch Me If You Can. And congratulations for an amazing, amazing film. Congratulations. And the winner of the grand prize in the WWCRS 2021 Film Festival is Prithvi Chandra Kant from India with the video, Catch Me If You Can. Yes, this is a parasitic eye infestation in humans caused by sheep bot fly. The diagnosis is usually done using slit lamp and a compound microscope. But here we diagnose, treat and record the microscopic features using two low-cost smartphone assisted intraocular lens device. It is made by creating holes on top of a 4 into 2 centimeter chart paper and attaching a lens with a liquid adhesive and then attaching it further to a camera of the smartphone. Examination under Aspire. Patient's left eye with visual equity of 6 by 6. The conjunctiva look congested with 1 to 2 millimeter translucent worms with dark head crawling all over the conjunctiva. This is the video showing examination under Aspire. To be noted, it is done without a slit lamp. The larvae were taken out of the conjunctiva using forceps and the magnification through Aspire without the help of a slit lamp. The replacement for the microscope is IOL scope, that is smartphone based IOL microscope. In this again, you take a 4 into 2 cm chart paper and punch a circular hole in which you attach four IOLs and then it is attached to the camera of the smartphone and then used on top of the slide below which there is an illumination. Larvae were put into 20% alcohol and prepared on a slide for IOL scope examination. They were identified as first term larvae of oestris ovis, sheep bot fly, which causes ophthalmomyasis externa. Aspire and Ioscope are two handy smartphone IOL devices which can help one get a closer look on the organism and help in prompt diagnosis of such cases. Fantastic. Brilliant. Congratulations, Prithvi, and, and wonderful film and, and a beautiful film. I think everybody who's watching this show, please go ahead and watch these films, especially the winners category and the not to miss ones. Uh, of course, all of them are winners in my eyes because each of the films that when you submit a film, you're already a winner. You've already joined the gang of ophthalmologists across the world. So thank you so much. And judges, I couldn't be more thankful to you guys for the hard work and the effort uh, that you have put in because of this taskmaster. So thank you so much. <laughs> uh, and I will see you next year for 2022 World Film Festival Award Show. Thank you. Moving on friend. to the next. Thank you so much. Uh, we thank still you. have a new session, which is the complex and challenging cases by Ehud Asya and Yasin Dawood. So moving on to that one. Thank you, judges. Thank you all. Thank you. Complex and challenging cataract complication session. The moderators, Ehud Asya, Israel, and Yassin Daoud, USA. We welcome the panelists, Ishtiak Anwar, Bangladesh. And featuring the speakers, Robert Osher, USA. Ryan Kim, USA. Jason Jones, USA. And Michael Snyder, USA. Organizers. Sergio Canabrava, Brazil. And Ashvin Agarwal, India.
Wonderful session, and uh, we really thoroughly enjoyed the videos previously after that creepy uh, video and amazing innovation. Uh, we actually have amazing uh, faculty that I personally have learned a lot from. Uh, I like, uh, this is Yasin Dawood from the United States, um, and my co-moderator is Ehud Asya. Ehud, you, the floor is yours. Well, thank you. Thank you very much, Yasin, and I would like also to introduce our, uh, our panelist, uh, Ishtiak Anwar from Bangladesh. And I think that we should start with the poll, if I can just see it. Do we have the poll for, for the question for this session? Yes, can you see the poll? Uh, if you want, I can read the poll, but uh, give me a second. Okay, we got it. Okay, good. Okay. Okay. Now, in an eye with severe subluxation of a posterior chamber intraocular lens, which is within the capsular bag, what would you do? Number one, remove the posterior chamber IOL and implant an alternative anterior chamber IOL, or remove the PCIOL and suture a new posterior chamber IOL, remove the PCIOL and leave the IA fake heat or suture the same intraocular lens to the sclera. Now we will have the results of uh, this poll at the end after we will show all the presentation uh, for the beginning of the discussion. So let's just uh, start with the presentation. Yasin, please introduce the first speaker. Uh, uh, so it gives me a great pleasure to uh, introduce Dr. Bobby Osher and he is a fantastic mentor of all of us. He uh, tells us about uh, cataract as it is. Uh, he's a phenomenal surgeon. He has graduated so many ophthalmologists and uh, uh, you know uh, every time I you know I look forward wherever there's a meeting I actually make sure that I listen to him and I make sure that I every time I learn something amazing from him so without further ado uh, Bobby Can we have the video for Bobby Osher, please? It had just been announced that there was a mandatory closure of the Cincinnati Eye Institute for the pandemic. Everyone was panicky. There was complete chaos in the operating room. This was my very last procedure. Some of the nurses were in tears. They were frightened. They thought they would be laid off. Despite this, the surgery went very smoothly, and I reassured the patient that she had an excellent operation. On the first post-operative day, the eye looked excellent, but her vision was poor. I had planned to put in a plus 22.5 lens, but despite our triple check system, I had been given a 20.5 lens. This was a terrible situation and I had to explain to the patient why I had to take her back to the operating room that same day. Moreover, I had to find the husband who had been quarantined in the parking lot and explain to him why we had to go back to the operating room. I reopened the capsular bag. It was very easy to do, and I rotated the lens up into the anterior chamber using this blunt-tipped Y-hook more OVD in front and behind the lens to protect the endothelium and the posterior capsule respectively. And then I placed the Snyder Osher scissors into the eye and start chopping up the lens. With counter traction through the stab incision, it was quite easy to make a number of incisions and take out the lens and pieces. 
I try to be very reassuring to the patient and to the staff as well who had come in special and were scared to death of this new viral enemy, COVID-19. Out came the old lens and this time when I refilled the capsular bag with Helen 5, I implanted the correct lens. I checked it myself and I reassured the patient that all was well. I rotated this lens into the capsular bag, centered the optic, hydrated the incision, and completely removed the OVD from behind the lens, evacuating the capsular bag, and then from in front of the lens, clearing all OVD from the anterior chamber. I brought the pupil down with a meiotic, hydrated again to make sure that the incision was watertight, and the eye looked very nice at the end of the operation. And yes, I did check to make sure once again that the correct lens was implanted. The following day, she had crystal clear 2020 vision. I think while the world is going through COVID and all of us were freaking out, only very, very few people can have nerves of steel and really perform beautifully under pressure. Beautiful video, Bobby. This is really fantastic. Ehud. Ehud said there are no severe complication of COVID-19 in the eye. <laughs> okay. Okay, so let's move to the uh, second presentation. This time I would like to introduce Brian Kim. He would, he would uh, introduce subluxated cataract with capsule retractors, CTR, sutured CTS with Gore-Tex. Brian, please. All right, thank you for having me. Uh, let's see if I can, can you all see my screen here? Yes. Okay. All right, so I want to thank Sergio Ashvin, Dr. Asya, and Dr. Daoud for having me. Uh, this is a tremendous opportunity for all of us ophthalmologists from the entire globe getting together and learning from each other. And I'm just honored to be a part of this illustrious uh, group of surgeons here. So this is my case to trampoline, springs are broken. So my top 10 pearls to preserve the bag and manage the dislocated lens. I have no financial interest related to the talk. So this is a case. This is a 44 year old white man referred for a dislocated cataract evaluation with a history of blunt trauma. And so you can see this is the area of zonular weakness, dis dehiscence, and this is an area of vitreous prolapse. So principle number one, a non-routine surgical situations require non-routine surgical maneuvers and planning. And so that's kind of my first rule in, in these situations. You can't bumble through hoping for the best uh, and doing this with a routine cataract approach. You have to have like a chess player, you know, plan A, B, C, D ahead of time. Goal number one is to implement strategies to remove the cataract with minimal zonular stress. And this also means what kind of different things can I do from my standard technique to achieve this? And goal number two is how do I address the dislocated capsular bag and create a stable and secure environment for the IOL? And principle number two is the best surgeon is not the most skilled surgeon, but the best prepared surgeon. And so, you, like I said, you have to have multiple plans ahead of time. What if I can't save the bag? Maybe I have to do uh, you know, a glued scleral fixated lens, suture fixated lens, intra-scleral haptic fixation. What if there's vitreous loss, lens loss? You just have to have all of these tools in, in place and be prepared just in case. And so to better understand the issues, I like to use the analogy of a trampoline. And so the trampoline mesh is a cataract, the springs are the zonules. And so the zonules are attached to the ciliary body and stretch the bag with 360 degrees of outward force to keep it stable. Uh, if the zonules are damaged on one side, there will be a stronger pulling force on the other side, which causes the capsular bag to shift to the right. And if it's really severe, it actually will fall posteriorly. When sculpting the lens, this imposes a downward force, which can stress the zonule. So this can be a challenge. And then when you grab lens pieces with high vacuum near the area of zonular weakness, this can cause a capsular bag to collapse into the tip. 
And when you do this, it can lead to a capsule rupture, vitreous loss, lens fragment loss, retinal detachment. This to me is the biggest challenge when you're dealing with cases of, of dense lenses as well as zonular disease. And so these are my top 10 pearls on how to handle a situation like this. So first you wanna tamponade the vitreous with dispersive viscoelastic to keep that back. You wanna paint the anterior capsule with trapan blue. I don't like to put too much dye into the eye. You wanna be very careful, methodical, painting like a paint roller. And then I like to cystotome to puncture the rexus for minimal zonular stress. I normally do a forceps puncture technique, but I think the cystotome is better here. Place capsule retractors as an anchor to support the zonules during rexus creation. You can use micro forceps to precisely place the retractor around the rexus edge. To me, this is so much more simple and easy to do. If visibility is still poor for the rexus, go ahead and paint more tripan blue. Even though there's viscoelastic, it doesn't mean you can't use tripan blue again. So again, use a cannula as a paint roller effect. Avoid a large rexus because the anterior capsule rim is really essential for a capsule tension segment. And if there's no anterior capsule rim, rim, the capsular tension segment cannot support the capsular bag. You place more capsular retractors as needed. And capsular fornix hydrodissection is a technique that I use. There's gentle and reliable lens separation. It's deep in the capsular fornix. And remember, don't spin this lens. You don't want to rip any more zonules. You want to apply a contralateral capsule retractor to ensure more support on the other side. And then you want to employ a gentle CTR insertion technique. You want to use the uh, Isinski hook to grab the leading eyelet. And as you deliver the CTR, it can grab it and it just minimizes torsional stress on the capsular bag. And you need this in order to keep that capsular bag away during FACO. You wanna employ a mechanical fracturing technique which reduces vacuum and ultrasonic energy, which I call double chop and cross chop. You place a chopper around the lens, place the FACO tip vertically subincisionally and it, it fractures the lens. You want to make, use a chopper and fake a tip to apply opposing forces to fracture the lens pieces. Use a chopper to hook and prolapse pieces up, out, out of the bag. And since vacuum is not used at all to disassemble the lens here, there's minimal risk for posterior capsule rupture. All the movement is at the iris plane. Successive crushing maneuvers with pulses of ultrasonic energy are used to remove these small fragments left over. Look at the CDE, it's very, very low for this dense lens. And then you place the chopper deep in the bag to protect the posterior capsule. You wanna pull the MST capsule retractors to the main incision for easy extraction. And then you're preparing for the capsule retention segment and I'm gonna use a scleral suture fixation with Gore-Tex. There are other excellent devices. Dr. Asya also has his anchor, which is phenomenal, but I'm just using the CTS here. A limbal traction suture is placed to expose the inferior sclera. And I'm performing a pyridomy, and then I'm gonna place some ink marks two millimeters back, make a partial thickness scleral groove, and then stab on either end of the groove full thickness. I'm gonna place the CV8 Gore-Tex suture through the eyelet there with the needle and then I'm gonna cut the needle off. And then with the micro forceps, I'm gonna place the CTS carefully under the rexus edge on the left side here. Using micro forceps through the sclerotomies, I'm going to retrieve the suture ends with a handshake technique. These are 23 gauge micro forceps. And I'm gonna do the same maneuver on the other side. Gore-Tex is rather unforgiving. And so when you're trying to tie this down, you don't want to make it too tight because it's difficult to loosen. So you do a slip knot technique. And then I'm going to do anterior vitrectomy here to remove any potential vitreous debris. And then you're going to do a one, one, one. And this allows you to carefully titrate the tension. You can see there's pretty nice tension on the capsular bag with this CTS. You have to bury the knot at the end to avoid suture erosion. And then you place your sutures to close everything. And that's the end of the case. And so in summary, although there are many steps with special techniques, these challenging cases are made easier with proper planning and you can have excellent results with these techniques. Thank you for your attention. Well, thank you so much, Brian. And uh, uh, Yassine, why don't you introduce the next speaker?
Uh, so with us is uh, Dr. Jones. Dr. Jones is uh, one of the world experts about the next topic that he will be talking about. As a matter of fact, I still quote his paper from 2014 regarding how we manage the IOL in uh, cases of dislocation. And we probably will be talking about it during the panel discussion. He will be talking to us about management of IOL malposition in the setting of the dead bag. Uh, Dr. Jones, the floor is yours. Thank you very much. All right. Okay, so uh, the dead bag is perhaps a new concept, uh, or maybe some of you have seen this in your own practice. And I know that I did going back many years, uh, something I've kind of come to recognize though, which is amazing how, how insinuous uh, this was in my practice. I just didn't realize it was quite there. This was originally termed uh, by Sam Maskett. He uh, had a patient who had a longstanding intermessic cataract um, and he did the removal. Afterwards, he had an eye well decentration within the capsular bag, uh, and then he noted an absence of lens epithelial cells. And his concept was that there was a pressure necrosis from this high intralenticular pressure uh, that resulted uh, in this situation. Now, in my experience, uh, in my own patients, I have about a, a dozen patients that I've been able to find uh, in my own practice. I find that uh, these present years after uncomplicated cataract surgery, these were not intumescent cataracts. Um, and so it's different than perhaps what Dr. Uh, uh, Mask had originally found, but I've had a variety of different IOLs, uh, three piece acrylic and silicone as well as single piece acrylic. Um, the capsule bag is very flaccid and it may or may not be centered. Um, the IOL is decentered and even dislocated. Uh, the hallmark really is an absence of fibrosis and other lack of cell proliferation. So there's no L-shaped pearls or submarine ring present in the capsular bag, uh, which is quite shocking. Um, and the histopathology, I have retrieved several of these capsular bags, um, and there's an absolute absence of LEC material. Um, there's no super exfoliation I would add as well. Um, and there is actually some evidence of peripheral capsular splitting. Um, and uh, I've noticed this as well as several other surgeons, Paul Fram, obviously Sam Baskett, uh, Greg Ogawa, and we've pulled some cases together. Uh, we do have a, a case series that is uh, pending uh, uh, publication. So uh, this is my most recent uh, dead bag experience uh, of surgery that I did back in 2016. Um, and this presented only uh, last year. This was uh, right before our COVID shutdown, actually. And you can see this capsule bag is utterly translucent, but also very decentered. Um, the surgery was uncomplicated at the time of the, the original cataract surgery. I just removed the lens. I really wanted to remove the lens and preserve the capsular bag so I can retrieve it for histopathological analysis. But you can see how easily this removes. Um, there are really very little attachments to the design of the fibers here anymore. And I'm going to then place a Yamani lens, but I think any lens that you prefer to place in the absence of capsular support is, support is appropriate. This is a different case. This is more than 20 years after original cataract surgery. Uh, and you can see here this three-piece silicone lens. Originally, I thought this lens was still in the capsule bag, but indeed, I was reaching through this diaphanous capsule bag to grasp the haptic and uh, go in through the pars plana and perform a vitrectomy and then puncture the posterior capsule because it's been floating on the anterior hyoid. Um, and that's how clear this capsule bag was. It just was not apparent to me uh, that this was actually in that location. So uh, we treated the lens, uh, then uh, bisect it, remove, and then once again, I'm going to retrieve this capsule bag. It's amazing there is enough integrity as there is an irregular capsular defect in the posterior capsule that it still actually is able to be removed without just splitting apart and becoming little sheets and pieces. Um, and then once again, like the mining technique in this case is employed. And then lastly, I have for you in this case, um, this is uh, another patient who's uh, perhaps uh, 20 some years out from original surgery. Um, and I'm going to, uh, there we go, okay. So I'm just gonna inspect this lens first. Um, the capsular X, I know it was very centered. Uh, I just wanna make sure that this lens is actually uh, intact, and no defects of the haptics here. So then under direct visualization, I'm gonna place this lens back in the sulcus. The manipulations tell me that the 
capsular mag has good integrity, at least in terms of its annuals. But being that I've actually seen these cases perhaps progress, I do warn these patients and a patient like this that, that there may be further uh, events later on and I need to come back. But also had a small enough capsular excess here that I could actually do an optic capture with a really excellent situation and a much more easy um, uh, you know, fixed issue there for this person. So uh, peripheral defects in the capsular bag can be present um, and the lens can dislocate uh, into the vitreous. Um, the zonules can be anywhere from normal, as you saw in the last case, of markedly looser than the hist. Um, the attempts to resuspend the bag with collateral suture techniques and, and devices uh, is at best challenging. And I have had discussions with other surgeons who have actually attempted and achieved this with um, you know, capsule tension rings and, and, and capsule tension segments, um, only to be fooled and later on have to go back and, and remove all of that hardware and get something different. Uh, last of suturing of the IOL. Uh, you know, in the bag actually is another thing that is, is actually really not possible due to the lack of fibrosis. Um, and then with a, an irregular capsule defect, uh, that tear can propagate, and then you're not going to be you know, fixing that lens any longer. So I feel an IOL exchange or replacement with the scleral fixate lens is perhaps preferred, obviously, in AC IOL is potentially uh, a consideration in certain cases. Um, and I think every case has some specific issues that may require individual management, such as the um, optic capture I demonstrated in the last case. Um, so I think this is a relatively uh, interesting, uh, not a very common uh, problem that shows up later on. Um, and perhaps it may be something that uh, isn't well recognized. Uh, it's certainly not been published. Uh, and so that is underway in terms of making people more aware of this. Um, and I, I will admit that when I look back in my old videos, I indeed found some dead bags um, and I didn't recognize it. Time, I just was worried about actually getting that lens out and putting new lens in and actually you know, making things work. Um, I have actually also with the three piece lens uh, done iris fixation, which certainly would be another reasonable choice in certain circumstances. So I thank you for your attention and I look forward to the discussion if possible. Well, thank you very much, Jason. And uh, we will move on to our last talk. And that will be Michael Snyder from Cincinnati. And maybe we'll talk about IBIS prosthesis in cataract surgery. Thanks so much for giving me the chance to talk about iris prosthesis in cataract surgery. I'm passionate about this topic. I do want to acknowledge my disclosures here, the most important of which are highlighted. This first case is a congenital aneritic, and it's a relatively dense lens. I like to stain the capsule in all patients that are going to require an iris prosthesis. In this case, you'll notice we used ICG to stain the capsule because congenital aneritic capsules are super thin, one-third normal thickness compared to others. Accordingly, the tripe and blue can reduce their elasticity and make breakage more likely. So the tripe and blue is not the, the best choice. The ICG is much more gentle. You can see that this particular cataract is rather dense. Usually, congenital aneritic patients present at much younger ages and the lenses are soft, but as you see here, that's not the case. The FACO is really uneventful and is not appreciably different from other cases, just making sure that we use a relatively zonular-friendly technique since all congenital aneritic patients have some degree of zonulopathy. Once the nuclear material is entirely gone, we're going to make sure to pressurize the anterior chamber with OVD before removing the FACO handpiece, since that can cause the chamber to collapse and put greater stress on the already weak zonules. So the handpiece is now able to come out safely. The INA is not appreciably different from routine cataract cases, again, just taking special care not to put any undue stress on the zonules. I always place a capsular tension ring in zonulopathy patients, and I always place a capsular tension ring when I'm going to be placing an in-the-bag iris prosthesis. Here we measure the capsular bag with an intraocular ruler and trephinate it to the size of the capsular bag. We put it into an injection cartridge, and here we're injecting it into the bag underneath the ICG-stained nasal capsular leaflet. Then we'll unfold the superior and inferior aspects of the device and overfold the temporal margin so that we reduce the outer perimeter and then we can tuck it underneath the subincisional capsorexis and allow the device to expand into its native position. 
You'll notice that we caught the haptic in this one area up in the upper right part of your screen, so we're going to tuck that back underneath the device using a Kugelin hook under the capsule, and here's the result at the end. And the patient was very pleased. Here's the other eye done with other prostheses years before, and I think that you can probably imagine which one she likes better. This next case is a trauma case, and so the color of the device was matched to the existing residual iris tissue. In the operating room, there's a fibrous stalk going from the corneal wound straight through the front and back layers of the cataract. So the first thing we need to do is remove some of that stalk and then do some blunt and sharp dissection to separate the synechiae and adhesions from the iris to the capsule so that we'll be able to at least have an open enough area to create our anterior capsulorexis. We're going to stain the anterior capsule with tripen blue, which helps both for visualization and reducing elasticity in this very young trauma patient. In the areas where fibrosis is present, we'll need to use a scissors to complete the anterior capsular opening, and we just go for multiple paracentesis. We'll aspirate some of the residual soft lens material. Much of the lens material had already aspirated on its own at the time of the injury it resorbed. The posterior capsule also has this quite thick plaque where we need to cut through the fibrotic component using a micro scissors. And then once we get into a more normal capsular tissue, we're able to peel that around. If we keep the anterior chamber pressurized with OVD, we will not have any vitreous coming forward. You can see that there's quite a thick rind of capsular fibrosis here. And then we'll remove that once we get the entire piece completely circumferentially. And it's almost like a souvenir that's so darn big. So we have an anterior and posterior capsular rexus, which are intact. We're placing the capsular tension ring manually into the capsular bag. I prefer to place these in by hand. Some people like injectors. I don't have any objection to the injectors. I just like to feel the tactile resistance as I place it, since sometimes it can get hung up. The implant lens goes also within the capsular bag. These gummy lenses are super useful. We're measuring the space between the inside edges of the capsular tension ring. Then we'll take the iris device. We're going to place it on a trephination guide and place the tree find directly on the device. And we press hard to make sure that we go through all the layers. We peel out the part we're going to use. The other part is just a souvenir. And here we are injecting it underneath the nasal capsular leaflet of the anterior capsule. You can see how important the tripen blue stain is here so that we can tell where the device is unfolding. We'll then unfold the superior and inferior leaflets in front of the implant lens but under the capsule. And then we overfold the temporal subincisional portion of the device so that we reduce the outer diameter. And then we can tuck it underneath the capsular excess margin. Once it's under the capsule margin, we can allow it to unfold into its primary position. And we get a really nice final result. Here it is at the slit lamp result. And the next uh, frame is in retroillumination. You can see how much improvement we've had there. And the visual acuity was really quite outstanding, 2050 pinhole 2030, despite the axial corneal scar. In this patient, we have an albino patient where all the structural components are fine. Patient just has absolutely no melanin. So we're going to replace the IPE, the iris pigment epithelium, by using a black artificial iris device actually ends up giving a uh, Paul, Manu, excuse me, Paul Newman blue kind of appearance with that in place. You can see here at the slit lamp uh, the device within the capsular bag. Do keep in mind that in ocular albino patients, they also have an absence of choroidal and retinal RPE pigmentation, so they still may have some light sensitivity from the stray light getting through the scleral wall. Thanks so much for giving me a chance to talk to you today. This is such an amazing presentation. I really like to thank Ashvin and uh, Sergio for amazing lineup of faculty. Basically, if you actually want to be certified for iris prosthesis, uh, you will realize that most of the literature and the videos are actually provided by Snyder and a little bit of Bobby Osher. So you're really getting the best of the best in these, uh, you know, in these uh, uh, meetings and the WWCRS is the best that there is. Thank you so much for involving us with it. Uh, we will go to the poll. Uh, before we get to the results of the poll, Ehud, um, you asked these questions. I'm going to uh, kind of 
uh, get to you and say, what is your practice? Of course, you know, uh, you are a very gifted surgeon. You're incredibly talented. Um, what would be your favorite choice in these? And uh, I'll ask uh, Dr. Jones and Dr. Kim as well that question. You're muted. Uh, you're muted. Okay, I don't see the results. I don't know what uh, uh, the, the audience would say, but for me, the first choice is always to reposition the same lens. The lens is good. If the same lens is good after 20 years as it was originally when it was implanted. So that I don't see any reason why I need to take out the lens and put another lens and suture it. So I, if I can suture the same lens. So for me, my first and second and third choices would be to suture the same lens, otherwise I would uh, remove it. And then it's a question whether it be, be, will be a sutured IOL or anterior chamber lenses in a few cases, but which are also good. But uh, reposition and research ring is my first choice. And let's ask now our panelist, uh, uh, Ishtia. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, can you, uh, can you tell us what would you do in, uh, in this before we see the results of the poll? What would be your choice? Yeah. Uh, my choice is uh, just like yours, you know, uh, I would uh, try to put the lens that is already in the eye rather than taking it out and going for other choices. Yeah, so I don't see the results of the poll as yet, so... Um... How about Dr. Jones, what would you do? I think it really depends on the circumstance, obviously, as I pointed out with my presentation, that bag really presents some challenges for resuturing. Um, and I know there are some techniques you can certainly use, but I do find it more comfortable to replace those sorts of circumstances, uh, unless the capsule is really stable, an optic capture is a great option there. Uh, if there is adequate fibrosis, but not exuberant submarine's ring, I do prefer actually a suturing technique to the sclera as well. I think it's an excellent choice and really avoids a lot of large incisions, a lot of manipulations. Uh, there's a lot of submarine's ring, which you can encounter at times. Uh, you know, lassoing that, that capsule bag can be quite a challenge. And also, uh, it does provide a bulkiness that actually just seems to ride behind the iris and, and may provide some iris chafe and, and potential uncensor down the road. So for those cases, I, I often tend to, to like to remove and replace those lenses. So it, to me, it's a very individualized approach. It's not just one size fits all. Dr. Well, Kim? Yes, you asked a question. Now let's ask you, what would you do? Uh, I, I want to hear it from Kim and I'll say what I've got to say. <laughs> <laughs> so Dr. Kim, what would you do? Well, I, I agree with everyone on the panel. You want to keep the lens whenever possible. Uh, you, you don't want to do too much surgery if you can help it, uh, especially if it's a monocular patient and you feel like you can salvage the lens. Absolutely, that's the right decision. But as Dr. Jones pointed out, sometimes the bag is unstable. Sometimes the lens is in the bag, uh, out outside the bag, in the sulcus, wh whatever it may be. And uh, for whatever reason, if you don't feel like it's a stable situation, then I think explant is also a reasonable option. Uh, so I, uh, I, I totally agree with all of you guys, actually. I mean, you know, uh, uh, with the one thing that I would say is it totally depends on the type of the lens as well. If uh, historically, if it was a single piece IOL where it's going to be hard for me to suture, but now with the fibroproline, with the flange technique that has, you know, almost answered that question. But I've seen actually a couple of cases with UGH. So I agree with you, Dr. Jones, that sometimes if the complex itself is pretty thick, you have to worry about iris, uh, you know, pigment dispersion. But if it's a three-piece IOL, I have a very low threshold to actually just suture it. Uh, it's minimally invasive. You can do it through just Paris and TC sports. You don't have to open the eye much. The recovery is much sooner. Uh, Dr. Ehudasia had a beautiful point. The lens has been perfect for 20 years. If I can put it back together, you know, it's going to give the patient, you know, a decade or two more. So it, I think uh, the minimally invasive part is the best, but a single piece IOL, uh, with big summer rings ring, I would actually take it out and replace it with a three-piece IOL. Uh, 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 Dr. Asya, do you have access to the poll or should I read it? Uh, well, I no, I don't see the poll. If you can uh, read it, please. So the remove PCIOL in implant ACIOL is 14.3%. Uh, the remove PCIOL and suture in new lens is about 36%. And suture the same lens to the sclera is 50%. As Dr. Jones basically showed us in 2014, uh, basically, mammal is actually in 1991, 72% uh, of, uh, of doctors would do ACIOLs. And now, uh, the more that we are seeing that we are more comfortable with vitrectomies uh, and, the uh, and the techniques and the technologies, more and more of us are really going to put the lens where it normally belongs behind the iris 
uh, fixated one way or the other. So I, I'm really happy to see that uh, our, you know, and this looks like an experienced group that has answered. Most of them would keep the lens in and just fixate it. Um, any pointers when you are trying to have these lenses and to fixate them? Dr. Ishtiak, what, what, what would you typically do? Yeah, uh, the fixing the same lens? Yes. Yeah, I uh, actually try to, uh, if the haptic is there and the back, there is fibrosis around it, I will uh, use a proline, nine zero proline and try to uh, do it. But currently I have done it with a, the Canabrava technique, you know, putting a six zero proline on both side and then pottery on both side of it. Uh, so you are saying like the single piece I all, are you going through the piece, the single piece I all, or are you uh, going through the bag with your 6O and are you colorizing it before you get it into the yeah, eye? Going through the bag. So one will go over the uh, one haptic and another will go below the haptic okay. and then cauterize it with the sclera. Dr. Asa, you showed a good technique uh, with going through the haptic optic junction sometimes. Well, that's correct. I, uh, do, you can switch through the optic. And you can go with the needle, and you can do it also with the 6O. But uh, if the teeth is in the bag and the bag is five rooms, then I will go to one on the knees, one on top, and, uh, and then uh, externalize and do it with the 6O golden with the flanges. And um, if I can, I would like to ask uh, Brian. Brian, you are muted. So you can yeah, please unmute. I'm, I'm here. Uh, I have a question to you. You use CTR and CTS in the semi. If you take them together, it's a cyanic ring. Why not use one ring for both functions? I think I know what the answer is, but I would like to hear. Yeah, well, I mean, for me in that situation, I had them separately. I didn't have the Sioni ring the, with the eyelid, the CTR with the eyelid. If I did, I, I, I suppose I could have done it that way. It would have maybe gotten in the way during the FACO, but I definitely advocate for um, putting the CTR in that situation early because the bag is potentially floppy. It could be, you know, a dead bag, like Jason was saying too. So those cases of PC rupture are much higher, but that, that was the reason for that particular case. See, and, and I have one more comment regarding uh, the technique. You said if you would inject and re-inject vision blue into the eye. And uh, sometimes I experience that if vision blue goes posteriorly, you don't get a very good red reflex. You get actually a blue reflex, so it may interfere a little bit. I would be a little bit cautious with re-injection of vision blue. So Anwar, can you uh, tell us yeah. what you do in these cases by like being subluxated, um, mature white cataract? Yeah, I have, uh, I think I have uh, learned uh, from Dr. Kim's uh, videos in the YouTube and I do exactly whatever it does. And you have just pointed out a very beautiful point that if we put too much of uh, tepine blue and it goes posteriorly, then cases become very harder. There is very low uh, blow from the uh, posteriorly and it makes life very harder. So I, I just wanted to ask one thing uh, to uh, Dr. Bobby or Sharif. I, I don't know whether he's there. And, no, he's uh, not. No, he's, he's not, not here. Then I will ask to uh, all of you that if this was a lens of, uh, say, for 23 diopters and there was a one diopter more, so would you take that out or keep that patient for a monovision? And uh, another thing that, you know, I will scaffold, uh, it's uh, very uh, unique and uh, to see that Dr. Osher is doing uh, explantation, but sometimes in the eyes it tilts and there's a scope of hitting the posterior capsule. So if you put a uh, I will in the back first and then remove the, uh, I cut the lens and explain it. So these two questions. Um, yeah, so I, I can take a stab at this a little bit. Um, uh, basically you could use an eye all scaffold, but this is a single piece Gumpy lens. And he has, the, you can see that his AC was incredibly controlled and you know he was able to cut it into, into multiple pieces and the bag and the zonules were completely perfect. And this is one day after, so. Uh, I, I worry about a scaffold. I would put a scaffold in case I am worried that the vitreous may come forward. So I'll, I'll put the IOL as a scaffold to prevent the vitreous. But in this case, there was really no zonules, no capsular problems. If there was an opening in the posterior capsule, I probably would have a lower threshold to put this scaffold first before I actually start cutting my IOL. But in these routine cases, you can easily, I do so many multifocal IOL exchanges in patients who are unhappy and whatnot. Uh, they are referred to me and I basically do the same exact technique that Dr. Osher did. Uh, the uh, thing is that if the IOL is a little bit off target, sure, you could give the patient monovision, you could do the other eye, you could do refractive surgery. 
uh, that much, uh, you know, and uh, with Bobby's hands, uh, IOL exchange is not unreasonable in that regard. But it, it depends on how far off target you are and whether the patient is a good candidate for refractive surgery or not. That's sort of how I would do it. What would uh, our panelists do? Dr. Kim? Oh, yeah, I would have done it exactly the way uh, Dr. Osher did. I, I feel really comfortable cutting lenses and taking them out um, in the context of a one-day surgery. Um, I, I like the idea of cutting. I like the idea of cutting lens. I've seen some people just yanking out the one pieces out. I don't really like that. I, I think, and I love how he trimmed it into four pieces, so he was zero trauma on the the incision. So I, I, I love that. Uh, one last comment about the OVD. You know, the patient obviously had viscoelastic in the eye, so it wasn't going to go into the posterior segment. Um, and, you know, um, and so that was that one comment for that. No, no, if, if I can comment, uh, uh, you're right. You should not pull out the entire lens. Otherwise, you need a very large incision or you make it large. But if you cut this uh, lens in a kind of a zigzag way, you can actually pull it out. It becomes like a long snake. You can pull it out through two millimeters by four zigzag sutures. It uh, cuts, which is a very nice technique. And um, Dr. Dr. Uh, you know, I, I, in a case like what Bobby encountered, actually, I think I prefer not to have a second lens in the eye. I actually um, don't think it really adds a whole lot more. As you said, you know, it, it is a very stable chamber, um, and, and generally, I haven't felt the need to do that. Um, I, I would comment though about the number of cuts, and one of the things that I've noticed in some of the times when I am cutting a lens. Uh, you can get really small pieces of the lens that can be liberated. So although it's nice to actually reduce your trauma to the wound as you're pulling out pieces, I try to make sure I do most at most three you know, pieces, so two cuts. Um, I, I'd rather try to minimize the chance that some piece still remains in the eye because that actually is a known issue um, that can cause some infertile dysfunction later on uh, and lead to corneal transplant. So you know that, that's another issue that I would like to comment on. Doc Dr. Kim, regarding your uh, uh, sublex IOL and the vitreous uh, that was presented forward, uh, you put the tripan blue. Would you consider putting viscoelastic right in that uh, where the vitreous problem is and the lens is dislocated partially to reposition the vitreous back a little bit, as well as to prevent the tripan blue from uh, uh, coming back? I have had many blue uh, reflexes and it makes the surgery a lot more challenging. Yeah, so uh, I mean, I, the video was going 100 miles an hour, so I, I apologize for that. Um, but I did tamponade that area with OVD first. And I put the bubble in and I painted with the triplan on that other side. But the other point is this, even if you, I don't, I don't really get tripan blue in the posterior segment, I try not to do that by painting it. I don't overfill it. But you know, when you do mechanical fracturing techniques, the way I do the techniques, you don't really need a red reflex. So, you know, a lot of techniques where you're sculpting and you have to see the, the, the red as you make your trough, that's very important. But if you mechanically divide the lens the way I do it, and that was actually a winner on the, on the video thing um, where they showed that pre-chopper technique. It's essentially my technique, but using an instrument. Um, and I just use a FACO tip to do it. Uh, and it's basically uh, a very straightforward way. You just have to get comfortable putting instruments within the bag and, and crushing it, doing that technique. Uh, I think our time is up. Dr. Asia, do you want to, uh, do you have any, any question you want to ask the panelists? Uh, yes, I would like to make uh, one last comment to Dr. Jones' uh, presentation. Uh, I never heard the, the, the terminology of dead bag, I love it. Because uh, a couple of months ago, we uh, published a paper on four cases in which there was a spontaneous rupture of the posterior capsule. And the one thing, in, two things in common, one, the cell, capsule with zero cells, zero fibrosis, and all of them were, were with hydrophilic lenses, with spontaneous non-traumatic rupture of the capsule. So uh, do you have any idea why these lens lose all their cells and why they are, these capsules are dead, Dr. Jones? No, I don't. Actually, I just find it incredibly interesting. It's obviously very rare. Um, you know, it's, it's going to be very low census of these patients, as I think you probably discovered as well. Um, and I think actually capturing these capsular bags, using them for analysis has given us some ideas. There's also a characterization of whether zonulopathy has to be present or not. You know, how are we going to actually have two separate categories of, you know, dead bags, so to speak, one with zonulopathy, one without, or is this a continuum? 
really defining what this terminology really means. It's not quite fully fleshed out. Um, but as I said, you know, uh, Liliana Werner and Nick Manwes and I and a, a group of people have actually put together a case series. Um, it has been submitted for publication. We're really excited about that. Um, to, right. and it does seem to be in the literature. Yeah. Okay, and, and it's always after 20 years for the publication. Well, I think that uh, we need to uh, to end our session. I would like uh, to thank uh, our panelists, uh, Dr. Anwar. I would like to thank uh, Yasin for uh, being a co-moderator with me. And I would like to thank all the presenters. And thank you very much. And one more time, thank you, Ashwin and Veronica uh, Brava uh, for excellent, excellent uh, course. Uh, this symposium was superb and very well done. Thank you. Thank you, everyone, and really, really had an amazing time. Learned a lot from all of you, and I look forward to future meetings. Thanks all. Thank you. Bye -bye. Thank you. Thank you, Yasin. Thank you so much, guys. We are now moving on uh, to the brand symposium, and uh, we have a few words from our uh, sponsor outcome. Good morning. Thank you, Professor Conan, and thank you uh, to Alcon to invite me to this uh, important Congress. And uh, my name is uh, Luca Gualdi. I work in uh, private practice in uh, Rome. These are my financial uh, disclosure. And uh, I want to share Today, my experience with the Akis of Vivere, uh, my experience is on uh, 40 eyes. 18 of them were uh, bilateral and three of them uh, were a toric uh, model. Uh, it's very important to share the experience with the monolateral uh, implant because a lot of uh, um, patients can benefit from the monolateral uh, implant because especially if they are uh, slightly myops and uh, if they have no cataract in the other eye because uh, this lens uh, has no neuroadaptation like uh, multifocal or a diffractive IOL and uh, they can uh, see uh, good, uh, very good uh, with the VVT implant, especially if they compare uh, with the um, fellow eye, which is uh, slightly myops and uh, uh, they, they need the correction in the other eye. So they, they see better in the BBTI and uh, they have uh, the same independence for intermediate uh, vision, uh, even if they had uh, uh, no cataract in the other eye. So uh, my experience uh, included, uh, as, I said, as I said, the 40 eyes uh, and uh, the age range was between uh, 48 and 73. And uh, the sphere range uh, was included between 175 to uh, plus 325. Uh, the average of a corneal cylinder for the non toric model was uh, 0.32, and for the toric model uh, of the three implants uh, was uh, 138 because of uh, nowadays uh, uh, only from P3 to P5 uh, model is uh, included. The biometric uh, target was always uh, plano, but uh, we aimed uh, for the negative uh, power uh, near to, to zero to uh, increase uh, more the, the near vision. Uh, so if you wanna choose between a positive and a negative power in the biometry, it's always better to aim for a negative power, but we aimed always uh, to, to plano, to zero. So our experience uh, with VVT uh, post-operative results are very similar to those of the global study presented by Dr. Cohen, uh, in which uh, the distance vision uh, uh, was uh, uh, more than uh, 2020. So in Logmar was uh, minus, minus uh, 0, 0, 0, 0.05. Uh, they, they had uh, very, very good uh, uh, intermediate vision uh, and they, they didn't use glasses for uh, intermediate vision at uh, uh, 65 uh, centimeter and Logmar was uh, 0, 0, 0.05. And uh, uh, they had also in binocular vision a functional near vision uh, uncorrected uh, in which uh, they, they could see on around uh, 0, 0, 0.02 Logmar in um, so the, the vision was very good also for near, and they were uh, independent. Uh, almost uh, all, all the distance uh, were very good, 
Mm, sometimes they 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 have to use uh, uh, glasses of uh, around the plus 150 to see better the smallest character um, to increase the near vision but uh, in during the day they they didn't use uh, at all uh, glasses so uh, regarding the um, visual disturbance profile um, very very low um, side effects uh, of, um, around uh, less than 15% of starbo cellulose and gray's layer and uh, the, the effects are very comparable to the monofocal IOL uh, and especially patients refer side effects only because of uh, small uh, discrepancy of the biometry to plano if they were uh, uh, minus uh, 0 0.50 they refer as a glare, but um, the same uh, uh, happen with a monofocal uh, IOL. So the disturbance are uh, so, so low compared, in compared uh, with the multifocals. In fact, uh, in the multifocals, uh, multifocal IOLs, uh, the um, inclusion criteria are very, um, very difficult because uh, you have to include the positive uh, characteristic because uh, they, 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 they should be uh, an easygoing uh, personality with a positive uh, demeanor. And uh, um, you have to exclude a lot of uh, patients with uh, like uh, hypercritical, uh, with unrealistic expectation. And uh, in the VVT group, uh, um, you, you can uh, uh, include this uh, characteristic. So uh, the exclusion criteria between a diffractive IOL, which, which should be a multifocal uh, or an ad uh, uh, diffractive ad uh, between uh, VVT are very different. Um, for instance, uh, in, um, in the VVT group, uh, you can include also uh, professional uh, pilots like uh, night drivers because of uh, the, the far vision is very, very good. Uh, if you compare with a diffractive uh, IOL. And uh, uh, you can have uh, completely independence also, also to see, for instance, the, the dashboard or the steering wheel or the odometer. So you can see at all the distance when you drive. So the driving is very safe because you don't lose uh, uh, far vision uh, like uh, in a multifocal or in, in general in a diffractive IOL. So you can include also the night drivers in the BBD. And um, also um, in the inclusion criteria, you can include uh, this kind of crazy patients like uh, hypercritical type A personality, geniuses, engineers, or mathematics, anxious people, which uh, are people that uh, overemphasize every side effect, uh, side effect of a uh, multifocal IOL. Uh, and uh, as the, the, um, the vision with the VVD is, uh, is very good with no side effects, you can include the, this uh, patient because uh, uh, they will not say, uh, will not uh, um, uh, see that they, they have uh, Helos glare and uh, they, they are very happy too. In fact, uh, uh, we, we don't say anything uh, if, you, if we put uh, VVD. We, we speak with the patient that uh, we will uh, put uh, an IOL which, uh, they, which will give uh, more independence for uh, intermediate vision without saying that it's uh, uh, multifocal, premium, uh, because the patients uh, will pay the same uh, price and they are very happy and, uh, for, for this. There are some uh, precaution uh, with the VVT. Mm, of course, we, we didn't implant it in uh, eyes with ocular uh, pathologies like uh, macular hole, pseudosfoliation, because you, you can have uh, also the centration of the IOL, not only during the surgery, but also after years. And uh, you cannot exploit the central part of the IOL. Also patient with um, very high visual field uh, problem and uh, uh, patient with the irregular astigmatism, not only for the quality of vision, but also for the biometry result, because you cannot aim for a plano in this group and you have a toric uh, model, but you cannot correct the irregular astigmatism. So you, you mix uh, the center part of the, the IOL with the uh, astigmatism, uh, which is irregular and is not so good. Also, uh, the kappa L, L, uh, angle uh, is uh, 
can be uh, should be avoided if it's very very high kappa angle more than uh, 0.6 millimeters but uh, uh, in comparison of uh, um, diffractive IOL is less important because uh, is uh, is more forgiving with the VVT the kappa angle so in a small kappa angle you can do the implant in post refractive surgery, you should not uh, implant, especially in the postcard um, uh, radial keratometry, uh, keratotomy, because uh, you have an irregular cornea and the shifting uh, of the um, uh, refraction uh, during the day. And uh, the aiming of uh, biometry is not uh, good because you have an irregular cornea. But in the, for instance, in a lazy group, uh, PRK, post-PRK, post-smile, if you have a regular cornea with no uh, high order aberration like, like coma, uh, you can uh, implant. So it's a relative uh, contraindication, but you have to concern with the biometry because if you go to positive uh, power in, uh, in, in the biometry, you have not a good result. You cannot exploit uh, the, the intermediate vision of the IOL and they need more uh, glasses. Same uh, is for severe dry eye, because uh, it's not like in a multifocal group that uh, you lose uh, contrast uh, a lot if you, if you do with severe dry eye, but uh, you, you cannot uh, center the, the biometry. So also if you have a VVT uh, and the quality of vision is, is less because you have an irregular cornea, you, um, you may uh, have a problem in biometry because uh, there are studies about the osmolarity, which shows the, also that uh, if you go to plano, sometimes with dry eye, you cannot have uh, a good uh, result. So I, I, I brought a video because I would like to share the, the implant of the VVT to see more clear uh, the IOL. And this is an example of a femtocataract uh, IOL, which with the lens X, which we use in almost 100% of patients, uh, if they, they cannot because of uh, the anatomy of the eye, we don't, uh, you, we don't use uh, femtosecond, femtosecond cataract surgery, but uh, we, we do routinely with this kind of surgery. This is the femtocapsulotomy. Uh, uh, and our preferred pattern uh, with the spider and uh, the circle in, in the center. And uh, this is uh, the, the marking uh, of the IOL. It's, uh, it was our first uh, toric uh, implant of uh, Viviri. And um, the surgery, I, I removed the surgery because of uh, the time of the, um, the talk, but I want to focus uh, more on the, um, on the IOL like it's now from uh, you, you remove uh, from the, the pocket because uh, it's in, in the naked eye is uh, is completely uh, similar to uh, monofocal acris of uh, IQ, but uh, uh, there are uh, the two elements uh, uh, which differentiate uh, the, the IOL. As you see, the profile is very similar. So the small uh, plateau is not clearly uh, visible, but uh, you have the uh, in the two surface elements uh, employed. So the, the surface element number one, there is uh, the slight elevated plateau about one micron, which stretched the, the wave front resulting in a continuous focal range. Uh, but if you stretch the light in both uh, direction, myopic and hyperopic, the light uh, at hyperopic direction is behind the retina. So it's not very useful. That's why the second element uh, is uh, present in, uh, in this IOL, in which there is a small curvature change, which uh, shift the wave front anteriorly, shift it in the light from the hyperopic direction to the myopic direction. So all the energy will uh, be usable, useful, usable. So uh, the X-weight technology uses the transition element to create an advanced and delayed uh, wave front resulting in a continuous range of vision that utilizes full energy to achieve a monofocal wizard disturbance uh, profile. So this is the IOL uh, like uh, now insertion uh, with the um, uh, dispersive with the um, with the bioscholastic. We use uh, routinely the, the provis. And uh, this is another angulation of the insertion of uh, carefully of the IOL, which you have to put uh, in the in the, the cartridge in the injector. 
Nowadays, uh, it's not uh, yet available uh, in the preloaded system, but in the future, you will have uh, in the IOL in the Claron platform, so you can have uh, a, a smaller incision in uh, 2.2 incision. You can uh, insert the IOL. And uh, as it was a toric, uh, we did the, the, the first uh, rotation, uh, like uh, 15 degrees almost uh, before the intended axis and uh, it's very important to remove behind the IOL uh, the viscoelastic uh, because uh, uh, being the atoric model not only to don't have uh, um, hyper uh, um, an increasing of the IOP after the surgery but uh, to um, enhance uh, the IOL to be uh, attached to the posterior capsule to uh, exploit the stable force uh, uh, aptic uh, to don't rotate the IOL. And it's very important because also it's uh, VVD, so the centering of the IOL is, uh, is, is very important. And so the femtosecond cataract surgery is important because you can have a, a very centered uh, rexis, capsulotomy. So this is the IOL just after the, the implant, and this is the, another uh, um, visualization of the IOL. Uh, uh, as you can see, the small, uh, plateau and uh, the geometry of the, the IOL in the center of the two millimeters point uh, two. The IOL was very centered in the capsulotomy and this is uh, the implant after uh, one day, uh, the aberrometry, and uh, after one month you, you can see clearly the, the lens which uh, is, it was very centralized you can see in uh, this uh, aberrometry the, the small plateau of uh, one, uh, one micron. And uh, we are mm, very, very satisfied on, uh, on, on the vision because uh, the, the patients uh, are, are so happy. And we, we are waiting also for the toric model, uh, especially the, the T2, because uh, sometimes we have to exclude patients uh, because they have uh, 0 0.75 uh, corneal astigmatism and we cannot. Uh, put VVD because uh, the, the, independence, the independence will be not so uh, good uh, nowadays with 0 to 75 astigmatism. So uh, sometimes we have to do arcuate uh, incision with lens X to, to have a better effect on the astigmatism. So we are waiting uh, the, the T2, T6, uh, and maybe in the future, so the until T9 to correct uh, until uh, maybe four of uh, diopter of the astigmatism in the cornea to have a better effect. And uh, you, you can put this IOL to every kind uh, of patients uh, in, uh, in the future, maybe. And in my opinion, uh, the head of IOL, uh, mm, uh, the, the, mm, not the diffractive, but, but the refractive uh, uh, head of IOL in general will replace probably the multifocal IOL because uh, the diffractive IOL mm, gives uh, mm, glare and uh, independence for near also intermediate and uh, far but they have uh, um, symptoms so um, patients uh, really prefer a, a good IOL which gives 100% uh, far 100% uh, intermediate and uh, functional near and they prefer uh, to use glasses for near vision uh, just sometimes uh, instead of having uh, visual disturbance so in conclusion uh, agris of uh, VVD uh, provides um, uh, an uncorrected vision for far and intermediate with a good uh, functional near vision. The visual disturbance profile are similar to a monofocal aspheric IOL and quite well superior to those obtained with a diffractive IOL. And the uh, acquis of vivity IOL reduces spectacle need for near with a high satisfaction rates. So thank you for uh, your attention. End of the day, end of the event. Unfortunately, you need to say goodbye. But before it, thank you, our attendants, sponsors, and speakers. For us, it was a great honor to have with you here in these two days. And I have a new challenge. Last year, I, I did a challenge for my friend. And again, ask me next year, bigger again, okay, my friend? Your word, my friend. Thank you. Thank you, Sergio. Thank you, sponsors. Thank you, uh, speakers, panelists. And most importantly, thank you, moderators, because without whom this event was not possible. They have been a backbone to the whole 
constructing the event, the agenda, everything. So thank you so much, moderators. I also want to tell you guys, uh, WWCRS Part Three is going to be very, very challenging, but it's going to happen, and it is going to be the same time next year. Don't miss it. World WCRS is going to be the website. We will come back and we will launch it very soon. Thank you so much for being here. We want to go out of my way and thank my backend team as well. You know, we have Bombtick team. You have the Alvo events, Daniela. We have Sergio's team. We have Agarwal's team, and we also have Ivista, who've helped us a lot during this event. Thank you so much for being here, and I'll see you very, very soon. I also want to tell the audience over here, please, we love feedback. So please share your feedback because those are the things that inspire us. They motivate us. They keep us going and do better things for the field of ophthalmology. Thank you very much for being here. See you next year. Thank you.